This programme features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Well, hello, boys and girls, and welcome aboard this school drive safari, and a very special welcome to the Treetops Academy. And we are coming to you live from the Greater Kruger National Park in South Africa. And would you look at that? That is a whole bunch of hippos catching a suntan. What a wonderful day it is for them as well. Normally, they would be in the water but with it being a lovely cool winter's afternoon well they've decided to come on out and show themselves now my name is Ralph Kirsten and on the camera today I've got Fergus Hello, Captain Ferg. Yes, now please don't forget to send us your questions through your teacher because we'd love for you to be involved with us on this interactive safari. And what are we going to see today? Well, I'm definitely sure that we're going to sit here with these hippos for a little while. And I'm sure that we'll see lots of birds around the waterhole as well. And look at all of those ones on the backs of the hippos. Those are ox peckers, and they are helping to keep their hippos free of ticks and parasites but look at that little baby hippo wow just lying near to mom looks like catching a nice sleep must be very tired and mommy's quite happy there in the shade now normally hippos don't come out of the water until the night time but today is very special because they're all out wow I haven't seen this many times now also out on safari today, I've got Steve, my good friend. He's going to be in a car as well, like I am. And Taylor, she's out on foot. And so she'll be looking at all the small little things out and about here in the Greater Kruger National Park. So very, very exciting. And uh, as I say, you must send us all your questions because we can't wait to hear what you would like to see and know about. Now, I'm going to see what's going on here with these hippos. You see all these little youngsters, but I wonder how it's going over with Steve. Thanks, Ralph. Good afternoon, boys and girls. Sorry, you might not be able to quite see me yet. Scratching around in the bushes looking for some tracks. Hello, indeed. My name is Steve. I'm on my camera there, I've got Senzo. We are, in fact, on a vehicle, but uh, just in this little dry riverbed, you can see if Senzo's pans in front. It's a very popular area for, for leopards and lions to be moving through. So every now and again, we need to check these game paths. You saw this little pathway that I came down. It's coming down into the river. It's a little bit easier for animals to walk down, so we often walk on those to look for their footprints because that's often the best way to find animals out here. It is winter where we are, even though it doesn't look like it's winter. Abdul, good afternoon. How are you, sir? You want to know how we identify all the different prints? Well, first of all, Abdul, it takes a lot of time, but um, with practice, you get quite used to it. So I've also got a very nice little book over here, Tracks and Signs, and um, inside the book, it shows you all the different tracks of the animals. So here's a zebra. Let me just switch off. Here's a zebra. Jump a few little mongoose-like animals with different sizes. It gives you the size over there. And you start learning with the tracks. You start looking for the toes and the shape of this pad over here. And after a period of time, you get to the point where you can actually find these animals by walking on foot. It takes some time though, I must be honest, and that is what we've all done. We've spent lots and lots of time out in the African wilderness, and we specifically out here like to find lions, as well as leopards. The other animals we don't really track too much. We just go to the watering holes, and that's where they like to hang out, just like what Ralph has done. He hopes to find lots of animals coming down to drink, and uh, we are going to be searching other areas for animals, and maybe on their way to drink or on their way away from drinking but we're going to continue on straight down this dry river bed and who knows what we might find well 
look at that. There's some hippos out of the water. Some are in the sun. Some are in the shade. Some are big. Some are small. Some are old. Some are young. Look at that. Now we've got all sorts. And look how pink some of them are getting. I think that's a little bit due to the sun. But, well, it's like us as humans, hey. Sometimes we do like lying in the sun and getting a little bit burnt. It seems like the hippos like it too. Now, Conrad, you say, but all of them are fat. Well, yeah, I pretty much uh, think you're right, Conrad. And maybe if those birds poke them hard enough, they might, uh, all the air might go out of them. But they do look very fat, don't they? But that's what hippos need because they're in the water a lot. And so I think that's also why they enjoy it so much because they're very heavy when they're out of, on the land. But in the water, they feel uh, very light, like a balloon. There's what they should normally be doing during the day is wallowing in the water hole. So that's why it's quite strange to see hippos out of the water like that and especially so many of them during the day it's almost like it's the hippo's day out maybe it's a hippo public holiday but i really like that little one and you know what that little hippo over there he's he looks small for a hippo but he's probably the size of an impala Indeed, he's probably a little bit fatter, as Ralph said, than an impala. And here indeed is a male impala who is busy feeding on the grass. Now we're still in that little sort of depression, um, sort of sheltered a little bit from the wind, I suppose. And not only do, when I was talking about leopards and lions, like to move through these areas, it's also because these animals are down in the depressions. A little bit of shade down here and uh, they are feeding and the leopards and lions are coming to catch them but did you see those birds on his back they're very interesting birds indeed they're not just there for a for a casual ride see how they're combing through his hair looking for ticks isn't that interesting they're feeding on blood sucking ticks and he doesn't like it too much but there's nothing he can really do about it it's actually very good for him to have the birds cleaning him the ticks are, can often lead to disease, can also make them quite sick, um, can lose their condition, they can get a bit skinny. So it's very important for these birds to feed on them. There is a youngster, a young one on the neck. You see it doesn't have a red beak. Oh it does, sorry it was in the shade. I thought I saw a young one before. But they're quite enjoying uh, riding along on the impala. Darren, well, this afternoon we found a few, not too many though, but we've only just come out on safari this afternoon. But this morning I was on a bushwalk and we followed a pride of 10, 11 lions for many, many, many kilometers. So we had those tracks for a very long time. But there are so many tracks out here all over the place, lots of animals moving. So it would be really hard to put a number on that. But how many different species? I'd say probably more than 20, 25 different species quite easily we'll try and find a nice sort of open area for you where we can find some tracks easy to see tracks that is in the sandy bottom layer here tracks aren't very easy to see with experience you can tell what they are but if you're quite new at it not the best tracks to look at in the sand but um, we're going to continue down this drainage system and I think Ralph has got some more to talk about down at Chitwa watering hole Well, the hippos are still enjoying their time outside of the water. One or two of them are getting up and walking back, going down into the water, but the other one is still looking very lazy up there on the bank, enjoying the nice afternoon sun. I'm sure they are really happy. 
Now, Carmen, a little baby hippo like that one over there, it can weigh, uh, in some of them, even over, uh, it's about 80 kilograms. So what is that in pounds? It's, uh, over 150 pounds. So they are not light or small. They look very small in comparison to their mommy, but they aren't that small when we see them up close. And it's just quite surprising, hey? A little baby like that can weigh so much, but these animals are huge in compared to us as humans. So very, very interesting there. But uh, these aren't the only animals that we've got around here. We've got an ancient dinosaur-like animal. And here he is closer to us over there. Look at him. He's got his nasty smile on him. That's a crocodile. I'm sure you've seen alligators before. Or well, have you seen crocodiles on TV? Well, this one, he's also enjoying the sun, but he needs the sun a little bit more than those hippos do because crocodiles can't get energy on their own. They need to lie in the sun like this one's doing before they can get enough energy to go fishing or swimming in the water. With the hippos, they're just enjoying the sun. They don't need it as much as this crocodile does. But he, look how big he is, eh? That's, uh, that crocodile's bigger than me. And I'm uh, uh, close to two meters, so I'm not uh, going to be going anywhere near this crocodile because he could pull me in the water and you would never see me again. Wow. And look how big his teeth are as well. Just behind the grass there, those very white, pearly whites. I wish my teeth would stay that white without brushing them. <laughs> but crocodiles mostly eat fish, uh, not always eating animals like you might see on National Geographic. We can eat fish in the water and birds that come down next to the bank. It's only sometimes that they might catch uh, something like an impala. Now, Freya, it's, um, it's, it's not very hot today. Uh, it's a winter's afternoon where we are in South Africa. So it's winter here, not summer like it is where you are. So it might be a little bit warmer where you are, but um, where we are, it's a, it's a nice, cool uh, winter's afternoon. 83 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius. Um, but, uh, yeah, so what I'm trying to say is with a little bit of a breeze, it's not very hot. And so this crocodile could sit there for quite a while warming up. And that's why those hippos are also out of the water. Because when it's very hot, you won't see those hippos coming out of the water because they can get sunburnt very, very easily. And they can also overheat very quickly as well. So they don't normally come out when it's very hot until it gets dark. And then they'll come out at night and go and eat the grass. But this crocodile, uh, he seems to be enjoying the time out the water just as much as those hippos. Yes, well, not all the water is still available in this area, and it's very dry. We are in our winter months right now. Uh, you in the Northern Hemisphere are experiencing summer where it's nice and hot. Down here in the Sabi Sands in South Africa, in our summer, we get rain in our winter. As you can see by the grass around me, it's getting very, very dry. And in the summer months as well, little areas like this would be full of water. And that's what makes all the, this mud. But right now, that's very, very hard. So in the summer months, this is full, full, full of mud. And we get lots and lots of animals coming in here. It's talking about the heat. Some animals like elephants and buffalo and warthog, they love to come and play in the mud cover themselves in the mud because they get very very hot and the mud walk works as very nice sun cream for them in those early months so here is some elephant dung that i found right next to this mud wallow it's not very fresh but isn't that a very big pile of poo that's just one of them it's probably about five or six that come out at the same time and this is the elephant dung 
and it feeds on. I'm going to bring it a bit closer sense, but here is all the mud. You can see that it's definitely dried up, otherwise I would have been sinking in there. But very important for the ecosystem out here is all this mud, but now it's gone. So the watching holes where Ralph is are very important, and that's where we find our animals. So here is elephant dung. Can you believe I'm touching this with my hands? Don't worry. I'm a trained professional. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to break it open. And inside, you'll see that there's lots of grass. And there's sticks. Look at that. There's a stick. There's a little bit of grass over there. Lots of organic material. Now, what happens in these elephant dung is not only is it the elephant taking food from the vegetation and dropping it on the floor, this becomes an ecosystem. This becomes an area where animals will live inside, beetles and flies and insects. And there's lots of birds and lots of animals that come around and break these open to eat on what's inside. Isn't that interesting? Sometimes they're feeding on the seeds. Sometimes they're feeding on the, the organic material. And sometimes they're feeding on the insects that we find inside. So not just the watering holes are important ecosystems piles of poo are as well. So let's go back to Ralph and his hippos. Well, look at this, boys and girls. This little baby hippo has just woken up. And it looks like mommy there is trying to get it going, saying, come on, sleepyhead, while the little birds are fluttering around in the background. But it looks like baby's still a little bit tired, doesn't want to get up quite yet. Hey, look, you can see the ears are moving a little bit. Ellie, I would say this baby is within three months of age, I would say. It's not very old at all. And we did see it pop up in the water not so long ago. So I don't think it's very old at all. And mommy is still looking after it very closely. And I'm sure as well that we'll be drinking milk from mum. So, well, she needs to take good care of it because it's still a tiny little baby. Look at that. Also just enjoying having a snooze. And you know, like, like us, when we are babies as well, we need to sleep a lot. Uh, well, it's no different with hippos and lots of the animals out there. They need to take lots of little snoozes. And when they wake up, they're full of energy. But then uh, very quickly, they go for another sleep. So it's energy, 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 and then sleep, and then energy, 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 sleep. You know, that's how the days go by until later they have to sleep less and less. Now, Summer, that crocodile, uh, it's quite a big crocodile. There, we'll have a look at it there. See there? Uh, it's about, I would say, about just over two meters. So if we talk in feet, I would say between eight and ten feet. More so about ten feet, I would say, with from the tip of the tail to the tip of its nose so and that's not the biggest crocodile you get I've seen double that size and so this one is actually is a big crocodile but he's actually quite small uh, in comparison to some other crocodiles and ones that eat big animals like impala and zebra and there is a little baby one over there just in the bottom right of your screen there he is Look at that tiny little one. I wonder how old he is. He's probably also about three months old or so. Probably similar age to that little hippo. And that one also just enjoying the sun, hey? I wonder if that's mommy that looked after him, this little one. Because crocodiles, they look after their babies, not like uh, snakes and, and tortoises and so on that just lay their eggs and then leave them to themselves. Once they hatch, they're all on their own. But crocodiles, them, the mother looks after the little ones. And so we're seeing all sorts of little babies around out in the bush today. I wonder what other babies we'll be able to find. Yes, indeed, a very little antelope that that crocodile will gobble up for breakfast. This is a fully grown male stien bok. Now the word, oh, there he goes. The word stien bok means he looks like a stone. 
And bok is kind of like the South African word for buck. So he looks like a little rock in the road, doesn't he? He's very small. Probably only about this tall. I oh, sense there's the bird. Oh, it's gone. It was a very pretty bird we saw, but they're very hard to get on camera. But the steenbok, that was a fully grown animal. And you saw the little horns? That's because it's a male. They live in very small areas, but they are very, very cute, aren't they? Okay, well, we're going to keep going on. He loves this habitat around here. We're just out of the river now. Do you know what a habitat is, boys and girls? I wonder if you know what a habitat is. Very important thing to understand. If you're not sure, we will discuss it. So I'm going to leave that with you. Do you know what a habitat is? And if not, I'll explain it in very, very good detail. And in the meantime, it seems like a very good friend of mine has finally got her shoes laced and she's out on bushwalk. I couldn't tie my laces, that's why I'm a little bit late this afternoon. Look at this cool bird with a big yellow beak. This is a hornbill, and if some of you have watched The Lion King, then you may know this bird as Zazu. And we have lots and lots and lots of them around the camp, which is quite cool. They like people quite a bit, so they've become used to us a lot. My name is Taylor, and on camera with me today is Craig. And it's very nice to have you all joining us on the school trip. How exciting! Is it still there? It's very busy. It's still eating, I can see. I wonder what it's gobbling down. It could be maybe ants. It could be termites. I'd imagine it'd be one of those two species because... Actually, I think I know what it could be. I think it could be harvester termites because they're normally out working during the day. And it looks very full now. It looks like it's eaten a whole lot. But I bet it's been busy all day long. See, it's using its beak to lift up all the leaves, all the bits of grass... All those amazing things. Very cool. Well, we're going to go see what else we can find you on the safari. Let's go see that cute baby hippo. Well, look at that. Little baby hippo decided to get up. I wonder how long that's going to last because I'm sure he's going to get tired very soon again. But they're normally full of energy after they've woken up properly. So let's see. Look how mommy's just being very patient with the little one. Those little nudges. And I'm sure that little one will also be very happy that mom's right there next to him, eh? Look at that. You can almost see that she loves it so much. Wow. That's not every day you get to see such a small little baby out of the water during the day. Now, Connie, thanks for your question. This is the only species of hippo that we have here, the hippopotamus. And they are a species all on their own. No other hippopotamus is around. So when we see an animal that looks anything like this, we know that it is the one and only hippopotamus. And what noise do they make? Well, they make a noise like a... <laughs> That's what they do when they're in the water and they come up and they blow the air out and then they make a nice loud noise. They're not making too much noise at the moment. I think it's because they're all so happy. Little baby's gone to lie in the shade of mom. They're not moving around too much though at the moment. As I say, and they do normally stay in the water during the day. And so uh, they've also got to get out in the evening to go and graze. And that's when they walk around and leave their tracks for us all over the place. Yes, they do leave tracks. It's very hard when you're an animal that size not to leave a mark in the sand. And I've got the tracks as promised. I was going to show you some tracks. And this is the track of an animal who's almost a little bit bigger than the hippo. Can you see this track on the floor, boys and girls? Here is the one toe. Very big toe on the outside of the foot. And here is the front of the foot. There's another big toe over there. And then on the other side of the foot, there's another big toe. So this entire thing here is the track of a white rhino. Isn't that incredible? It is, look at the size of my hand. 
That is enormous. So here I've got a book open for you to see. There's a nice picture of the track over there, and it's up to 30 centimeters in a big male. And it's very wide and very round, and very, very similar to a hippopotamus track. The only difference in the hippo track is this big toe in the front here is divided into two. Instead of one, it's divided into two. And that's an easy way to tell the difference between a rhino and a hippo. But um, this rhino has walked along from a very muddy wallow behind me, looking for some mud, because as I said, they like mud. And he's been very disappointed in the fact that there's no mud behind him. And he's gone off walking that way. Very sad. But he will find some water. Well, we found you some tracks. We'll try to look for some more. We're going to be heading on a little bit further north to another watering hole, and hopefully we'll find you some elephants. Well, I'm just so happy to be watching this little baby with Mommy Hippo that I decided just to stay a little bit longer because it is so special, isn't it? When you're so small like that and Mommy looks after you so well, it's not only humans that do that, it's hippopotamus and giraffe and zebra and elephants. Now, Fleur, um, hippos are mammals as well, so they don't, um, they don't breathe underwater. They have to hold their breath. So what they'll do is they'll come to the surface and you watch their nostrils. They take a very big, deep breath of air before they go under the water. And then they can hold their breath for between five and eight minutes. And then they need to come up again to take another uh, fresh breath of air. So they can't breathe like fish under the water. They just hold their breath, like I say. So you'll see them coming up and going, blow the air out, take another breath, under they go. Now, Emilo, thanks for your question. Uh, lions are the ones that will uh, make the hippos a little bit worried when they walk about uh, during the night because lions will like to eat that little baby over there. So mommy needs to be very careful if she takes that baby for a walk to go and find some nice grass that she can graze on. She needs to be looking around all over the place for lions because they could very easily grab that little one away from her so that's why she doesn't let it out of her sight and she'll always be next to it and near it and if it's if she isn't the lions will see that and they'll very they'll very quickly come in and grab it without her even knowing so it's mainly lions that hippos need to be worried about not when they're in the water only when they're out on land but these hippos are on an island now so they don't need to really worry about lions now but it's during the night when they go to look for grass to feed on that the lions will be waiting for them but for now that little baby very happy and snoozing away and so I'm not going to be uh, catching a snooze like this little one. Why? Because I sleep at night. Not indeed, not at all. No snoozing for us. We've just started our work for the afternoon. Lots and lots still to do. And as I said, we're going to be heading this way, searching for some more animals. Hayden, very good. I am very willing to do that. Okay, so out here and everywhere you go, there are mountains and then there are streams and rivers and beaches, coral reefs, all of these areas you would kind of call habitats. But now within these areas, you have different types, smaller, bigger, larger. So where we are here, on the right hand side, we've got a sort of a a bit of a dip, a bit of a dip, where it's like a dry riverbed. And so you get different types of trees growing in there. Sandy soil at the bottom, it's a bit thicker. 
a bit denser and then we go a little bit further away from this it starts to open up a little bit and so the vegetation changes a lot of that is to do with the soil and how the plants grow and what plants grow there so you can get areas with lots of tall trees you can get areas with no trees just grass you can get areas with grass and trees you can get areas with lots of rocks now all of these you would call habitats and the more habitats you have the more animals you will have in those areas so for example just around the corner here there's often a little lizard sitting in a hole and that is his habitat so animals will choose a habitat they prefer somewhere where they can live where they live where they sleep where their food is where they can have their babies so that's what we talk about when we talk about habitats and there can be lots of them you know on that one little elephant dung that could be habit oh there he is he's right oh he's gone in i just jinxed it you see the hole there sends here we go he's looking at us here we go there's a giant plated lizard and now his habitat would involve somewhere to hide away like that a hole where he can go and it gets too hot oh he's coming back he's got a beautiful smile on him doesn't he so he needs to survive he needs holes quite often rocks but here yeah, he's making do with the hole in in a mound and he obviously needs food so certain plant types will attract certain food types for him and that will basically be his habitat so i hope that makes sense when we look at fish they have different types of habitats in different rivers where the water's flowing very quickly or the water's going very slowly. Those are different habitats. So when you're looking for an animal, you need to understand what habitat does that animal like? And then you go and you search in that area. So that's why we started off searching in the river because the leopards love the river and habitat. There's lots of tall trees lots of grass and this guy loves all sorts of things look at him licking his lips he's saying hello boys and girls okay well we're going to move off from our beautiful little lizard and we're going to go back over to the bushwalk team who i'm sure is walking in a habitat of their own oh so we haven't found too many things on bushwalk just yet i've been trying to find you some plants now I'm going to take the leaves of this one and we're going to walk with me, Craig, because we're going to go and stand at this tree, actually. So, this is a really cool tree. Both of them are really cool trees. This one is, the, is a little branch from a silver cluster leaf tree. And you can see it sort of has a silvery shine on the other side of the leaf. Okay, and then this one is a guari tree. And they're are not from the same family they're two different types of trees but they have a very very similar way of protecting themselves so some trees have got big thorns to try and slow the animals down from eating on them sorry let me stand this way because the tree was getting it all in my face this is a little bit better and then other trees will have types of chemical defenses so what that means is that they will have something that makes their leaves not take, taste very nice or they maybe have a milky latex and they bark and this one has got very 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 bitter leaves and it's because it produces something called tannins now you don't have to worry too much about that word but what tannins do is that they make your mouth very bitter have any of you ever eaten a grape before and sometimes you get a grape and it doesn't taste so nice it's a little bit bitter and it's the skin that's tannins that's the stuff that makes your mouth bitter so both of these trees have got lots and lots and lots of it in them so that if you chew them we'll take one one this is going to be really ugly ah, that's not very nice that takes all the saliva out of my mouth my mouth goes really 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 dry after i've chewed those leaves so that's what it does to the animals and then they go i don't want to eat too many of those leaves they just want to eat a few so that's quite cool so without of course those things to help uh, the leaves protect themselves animals would eat all of them but let's go to chitwa and there's a beautiful big bird Oh, that's like diving in.
Well, there we go. That is an African fish eagle. And he's looking down into the water hole. I'm pretty sure he's looking for some fish that he could maybe swoop down and grab because that's what they eat. And that's why it's called a fish eagle. Makes sense, doesn't it? You see there, and there's also a very big crocodile that's moving now, going into the water. Look, that one's also quite big. Very fat as well. Must be eating a lot of fish. Maybe he's going fishing now. I think so. He's going to go under the water and be looking for some fishies that don't see him coming. Uh, Tommy, I have seen some crocodile eggs. They go off onto the side and they dig a hole and then they'll lay their eggs in a hole in the sand just near to the water. And then when the little babies hatch out of the eggs, they make a, a very, uh, uh, well, the sound that they make is like a ow, ow, ow. And the mom who will be waiting nearby, she'll hear that and then she'll go and open the hole and help all the babies out of the hole and she'll take them then in her mouth and take them down to the water where she'll let them all go but she'll stay nearby and protect them in a little pool until they're big enough to go off on their own. But this one, I don't know if it is a male or a female, whatever it is, it's quite big and going looking for fish, I think. And this big crocodile, um, he weighs probably um, as much as a small car. They are very heavy, very, very heavy. And I'm not sure how many exactly uh, in the number of teeth that they have, but they have a lot more teeth than us. And they can also replace those teeth many times. They're almost like a ragged tooth shark, which can replace its teeth over and over again. Well, crocodiles do also have a few more sets of teeth than we we do. We only get two sets of teeth. And, well, the crocodiles and some of the other animals also get lots of teeth as they break off or when they break off, they can replace them. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't fight with a, hippo, uh, with, uh, with a hippo or a crocodile because of those big teeth they have. Rosie, the little baby crocodiles will eat small little things like little insects and dragonfly larva and small little fish and tadpoles until when they get a little bit bigger then they'll maybe eat some frogs and bigger fish and then when they get bigger they'll be eat bigger fish, maybe some small birds. You see that small little bird walking on the side of the water there? Those could also be food for the crocodiles. And they need to be a little bit careful. And that's a little wagtail, I think. And if there was a baby crocodile that was hungry enough, he'll go over and catch that little bird. But that little bird is also very alert, so he does know that there's crocodiles here, and he knows that he needs to be careful. So he's quite fussed uh, to get away from the little crocodiles. But the crocodiles will try and eat whatever they can. And look, they can swim quite fast, can't they? That one's already all over on the other side of the water now. Now, Grease, um, crocodiles, they literally just use their feet uh, because they've got webs between their feet. So they use their feet and they also swim a little bit like a fish with the long tail that they have. They use that to push themselves forward. So they'll go like a snake in the water and they go backwards and forwards and then the tail also helps pretty much like a fish's tail to push them forward. So there's a few different things that help them, but mostly that tail that pushes them forward. All right, you see that? It's a beautiful water hole, this, and we're still watching that nice brown and white kingfisher up there. Looks like he's still waiting for a fish to come to the surface so that he can see it and fly down and catch it with his big claws. He's always watching. 
All right. So, this is a, an extremely beautiful bird. And, well, we did see some pretty ugly crocodiles, I would say. And those crocodiles aren't the only ugly animals out here. Yes, well, it is an ugly animal that's just moved behind this piece of wood. I'm going to just move up half a meter. Hopefully it doesn't run away. But I'm sure you boys and girls have all seen the Lion King and you know Pumba. Well, this is the warthog. And Pumba is the Swahili word, which is an African language, for warthog. And that is an enormous female warthog with very big tusks. Did you see those tusks? Now, those tusks are there to fight or to defend themselves against... Oh, I'm going to have to move forward because she's hidden herself. Excuse me while I move forward, Senzi. She's hidden herself and she just had a little bit of a toilet break there. I'm glad we missed that. Those tusks are there to protect them against very large predators such as um, leopards, and cheetah, and sometimes even lion. Because pork is on the menu out here, and these predators really do like eating their bacon. So the warthogs have to be very, very fast. So their habitat, they need lots of and they also need areas where they can hide in the ground. Similar to that lizard, they sleep at night in the ground and that is how they are able to survive. If there wasn't any holes in the ground, then they wouldn't live in an area. They just couldn't. And that's why national parks are so important, boys and girls, because without all these natural habitats that you find out in national parks, animals will just disappear. You'll probably notice in and around your towns and cities, there's not that many wild animals running around, is there? It's because there's not as many wild habitats left in the world, so we need to be very careful, we need to manage them and we need to conserve them. We need to look after them for your children in the future. You are the ones who are going to be making the decisions. A lot of us are getting too old to be making those decisions. It's going to be left in your hands to make sure that the world continues on or to change, to make all the changes important to conserving all these beautiful animals in their natural habitats. And this is the tallest land mammal in the world. It's a giraffe. Wow, and look how tall he is. That is incredible. Look, he's almost all the way up to the top of the tree. Well, that's exactly why he's got a very long neck like that, so that he can get to the leaves all the way at the top. But. Uh, and look, he's also got the little birds that are f uh, trying to get some of the ticks out of his hair. Now, Harry, that just the neck of this giraffe is probably at around three meters. So what is that? Uh, let's double that. That's six. It's about eight. Uh, no, even more. Two, about 12 feet. 12 feet just the neck and if we put the whole body together from the top of the head to the bottom of those feet it's over five meters it is incredibly tall that is very very special now i'm just going to go in the river a little bit there and see if we can get a bit closer to him because he's walking away but i just think that he's looking for some more tasty leaves at the top of those trees that he can go and get. I see now, there he is. Now Mason, those birds' bills, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, they are very similar to what we have on our nails here. A little bit different, but nearly the same. So what you have, if you've got very big toenails, well, that's quite similar to those little birds' bills. But they're very sensitive and they can feel everything on the tip of those bills. So slightly different to your nails, but not too different. I've got lots of sand here, so I won't be surprised if I get stuck. But let's see if we can get just a little bit closer to this 
giraffe here. For such big animals, they do get scared very easily. So we'll just go a little bit slowly over here. But I think he's spotted some very special leaves. Oh, he has to bend down. Look, he's so tall, he can't even go underneath that tree. Look at that. Stopping over here. It must be quite awkward sometimes to be so tall. I think he would bang his head on the roof or on the door every single time he tried to go through. Must be quite irritating, hey? I know that I'm a, I'm a little bit tall, not as tall as lots of other guys, but I also get irritated when I bump my head on the door. But, well, he is a beautiful giraffe. And I just want to say thank you to all of you for joining us. And we hope you join us again on another school drive. I'm uh, going to get lots more animals ready for you for next time. So you guys all be good and we'll see you soon. Now, I'm going to continue on along the little riverbed here and see what other animals I can find. Well... Hello everybody, remember to send your questions through hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or you can also talk to us via the YouTube chat and some Facebook pages. Get commenting. Now, the reason why I'm holding this stick, it's a wealth area, I've broken it for good cause, is that Herbie has only said about 10 times now that there's a mamba that lives in this area. He's a little bit scared. So at some point today on the walk, I'm going to use this and I'm going to put it against his legs and try and scare him. So that's going to be my plan for the afternoon. Hopefully he didn't hear. He's a little bit further up ahead. Anyways, I've got some exciting news for you. Um, basically, we have found male and female leopard tracks from this morning. They seem to be moving together. Who is it? We don't know. We're going to try to find them now. But one of the challenges, of course, we're going to face is, well, trying to see the animals through the vegetation. So I'm going to walk along the animal pathway. Craig is going to follow. <coughs> Woo! Oh, I just scared a nightjar out. Hang on. <laughs> Sorry, I just sneezed as I normally do, Craig, and then a nightjar flew around. Let's see if we can find it again. That was good. <laughs> My sneezing works sometimes. It flew. Oh, there it goes. No, nah, it's not going to be happy. I just saw it get up and fly away again. <laughs> yeah, Lucas said some new game-finding tactics. Yeah, that's him. going to walk around. ha <laughs> How funny would that be? Anyway, what I was going to say is that if I walk along this animal pathway, I bet you're still going to have some problems seeing me if Craig sticks to the road. So I'm going to go a little bit slowly. Oh, there's another one. I just scared another night child. <laughs> okay, this is not going to work. I'm obviously not supposed to show you how camouflaged I can be walking behind the trees. But uh, let's go across to Steve, who is going to hopefully find you some cool things. There's nothing like a McCurdy sneeze to wake the dead, I suppose. The night jar. How's that? I've never, I've only spotted a few night jars during the day that have moved because I've walked maybe a bit close to them. <laughs> the McCurdy sneeze, that's going to go down. That's going to go down. So, um, Herbie has just informed us of the tracks he's found. So we're coming back. We've, we're up towards Pufflesook Dam. Scuba Steve, the illustrious. Scuba Steve is back from his vacation and he had some surfing terrapins on his back as is his way um, but he then went under again and they flushed off the back and I was more interested to come give Herbie a hand with some tracking so let's go see if we can find this pair of leopards that are moving around who could it be and are they indeed mating I don't know Herbie seems to think so who could it be? Maybe the Shadulu has come back from the west, or from the yeah, from the west, and Hukumuri is finished with his his jaunts down in the east. I have no idea. JB, that's a very good question. Um, predators will hunt when they're hungry, mainly, but they will never l lose the opportunity, miss the opportunity to hunt something that just materializes itself they will hunt i've seen full 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 lions hunt but it's because the animal just put itself in there 
Uh, we were with Uncle Hoomers a couple of weeks ago, and they hunted purely because the weather changed. The wind picked up, and a warthog decided to run towards them. But they're not going to put in too much effort if, um, if they're full. They will just be opportunistic in that regard. I've had a leopard up a tree. We saw him kill a baby zebra in the morning. And then by the time we found him that afternoon, he had the zebra and two baby warthogs up in the same tree. So just opportunistic. Things come around and they will hunt if it just if it just presents itself. But they won't actively go hunting and searching for food if they're full. If they have a kill as well, they'll just they'll just relax. It's all about those drivers. The hunger drive the need to sleep drive and the same goes for for when they are mating they'll often forget about mating for for a few days because that's all that's on the mind if you're watching the show oh he's gone saturday there were we had some water buck that were he was he was not feeding he's just following her you see giraffe males follow a female for days trying to mate as she's constantly feeding as she goes and with predators, that's the same. They will not mate. They will not feed for days, and then suddenly, after mating three, four days in, they'll split. And then, I'm sure the first thing on their minds is food. That's why mating cats on foot can be can be quite precarious, because their their hunger is quite relevant. And you put the, yourself in a position where, you know, is their hunger greater than their fear of man? That can happen. So you need to be extra careful on cats that are feeding and cats that are mating. Likewise, cats that have cubs, because um, that need to defend their cubs outweighs the need to run away. So these are all very important things that we can read and find out about the tracks in the bush. And um, yeah, well, we're gonna be joining Herbie very soon in his efforts to see if we can find whatever predators these may be. Well, I have now left the Chitwa area and I'm heading towards where I heard those alarm calls this morning where Tandi Tlalamba have been frequenting. So I'm hoping that maybe we'll be a little bit more lucky this afternoon and we'll get a little glimpse of whoever it was, whether it was just Tlalamba on her own or if Tandi has returned. Well, we'll have to wait and see. And you never know, we might not uh, find anything there, but I'm just going to turn around, uh, around those blocks where I heard those Inyala barking this morning and couldn't really find exactly where it was coming from or find any tracks. Maybe those two kitty cats have uh, moved around a little bit again or um, gone into a place that we might be able to see them. That's what I'm hoping for, but um, you never know, as I say. But you can't catch a fish unless you have a line in the water, so I'm about to throw one in. Uh-huh, Fergus, are you feeling lucky? Uh, feeling lucky Ferg's feeling lucky, so... Uh, <laughs> That's a good sign, so... I hope you're all feeling lucky, everyone, because I feel like we need to see Tandi and Shalamba. We need to find them on a kill, hanging in a tree. Hopefully we can find that. But we'll stop for anything else in between as well, looking out for any of these special little birdies. Now, Taja, you want to know if there's any news on the lions uh, this morning? Um, we are going to just follow up with that in a minute. Um, I was just busy with that, uh, with that school drive, so I wasn't listening too intently on the game drive radio. But I'm just going to wait and see, now that I've turned it up, um, if we get any news there. And I'm sure that Steve would have also been listening out. Um, as well as Taylor and Herbie, so we'll catch up in a minute and see. If they were around, I'm sure they would have gone flat by now, and what I mean by that is sleeping. So lions are great in that sense, in that if you find them in the morning and it's quite a warm, reasonably warm afternoon, you can, uh, and not only when it's warm, but generally, in general, you can you can say that they, um, they're pretty much going to be in exactly the same place when uh, you come out in the afternoon. So if there was a late finding this morning, then uh, it's quite possible that they're in exactly the same spot now. Not always, but 99% of the time, 
So we'll see about that. But, um, you know, the team is split out or spread out as well. So we just um, on the opposite end of, of camp than uh, the bushwalk team is as well as Steve. Yes, well, we are indeed. We are close to the area that Tony has been spending a lot of time, but that's her being up and down from Bivisuk all the way to Gallego Pan. Um, and Herbie's just asked me to come and have a look at the fire break. Somewhere in here, I mean, Voetzeller Lodge and Gallego Lodge are just there, just off to our left, and the tracks have cut off into the block here somewhere. So we're just going to drive the road very slowly and every now and again switch off. And if there's indeed mating leopards, we should hear it. Pisces, yes, I wish it was that easy to just call kitty 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 and they would come out. But we've got Herbie on the other end with Taylor, so he's trying to see where the tracks have gone. But they're somewhere inside here. But mating leopards, I've heard before many times, and it's, it's quite a sound. So we're going to be looking for fresh tracks, maybe coming in and out. I don't know how much of this area was was worked this morning. We were down on the other side. Um, I don't even think tracks were called in around this area. So this could be fresh. These movements could be fresh. So we're looking to see if anything crosses north. If nothing crosses north, well, then they're probably still in there. And sorry, what I wanted to talk about there is what's important to check is these uh, game paths just here on the left you can see it's quite a prominent game path going from sort of Voyatella going straight to a, another watering hole in the north and uh, most animals like to follow these when we were following tracks of the Unkuhuma lion pride this morning that crossed west they moved along quite a few of these little pathways including the road which to them it's just a pathway. They don't look and go, oh, I'm not walking on the road today. They just see a nice, easy way to move. No sticks and stones and thorns when you lie down. It's lovely. Lovely. And we're going to keep our noses to the ground. The nice thing is if it is a mating pair, there's going to be two tracks, which means it'll be easier to see than just the one. Ideally. <laughs> Ideally, well, talking about tracking, let's go over to the trackers themselves. Well, we're doing a perimeter check. So now we've got these tracks from this morning, these male, these uh, female leopard tracks. So we're on the road. We've lost the tracks, there, but we have marked the last ones that actually turn off and go all the way down into this drainage line. So what we want to do is we want to walk along the road just to quadruple check that um, there haven't been any leopards walking there all around the bend. And if we don't get anything towards the bend, then we know there must be still the sites. We've called Steve into the area too. So we're basically just doing a sweep, kind of like how we found the cheetah. And I always think it's so important when you're doing that while you're tracking is to give yourself an area to work in. So do a little bit of a boundary patrol, a little perimeter search, uh, of an area where you think that animal could have been and if that animal's tracks do not exit I mean there's always a possibility that you can miss those tracks if those tracks do not exit out then and you know they're probably in there and it'll give you a good place to sort of start and then you can start looking for things that animals like that like shade during the day drainage lines are nice because it's cool often you can find water so that's going to be a hot spot so we're almost getting to the point now where we're going to start entering in to uh to this drainage line which is going to be quite exciting i'm really looking forward to it Now, Zach, I mean, there's a number of different animals that alarm out here, and I just heard some now, Franklins. Franklins can also tell stories, though. and remember, because it's a bird that's alarming, it's not just going to be alarming for a predator on the ground, but also in the sky and in the trees. So a snake or something like that, they're going to be alarming for a lot of different things. So even though they are reliable, they will tell you when there's a predator around, you don't know which one though. If they're sitting up in a tree, normally it's a leopard or a lion or something along those lines or something that's on the ground. Normally if they go underneath a shrub, it'll be a bird of prey that was flying overhead and they want to look for cover. Um, other animals are kudu, inyala, bushbuck, 
all pretty good at alarming, and those are the animals that are going to be living down in and along this drainage line. So those are going to be the ones that we'll be listening out for. Anything like, um, what else have we got that would alarm? Squirrels? Storytellers. I don't like to listen to squirrels, but sometimes they tell the truth, but not always. Like It's kind of like an 80-20 sort of ratio. Uh, 20 being the times that a, a squirrel is right. So there's a lot of different animals around here that we'll be listening out to. Anyways, we're going to carry on, and we haven't seen any more drats, so that's quite good. Off we go back to Ralph. Thank you. As I'm doing a little bit of four by fouring here, just coming through towards uh, Twin Dams, I'm just going to poke my nose in here, and then um, and then we'll zigzag through this area and try and see if we can find ourselves some of these sneaky leopards that are walking around here. And just as I say, start off at this waterhole. Just poke our noses, and maybe there might be an elephant or two. You never know. This is a good part of the day for them to come and have a little drink. Sometimes we get lucky with that as we come past these beautiful leadwoods here near to this waterhole. A couple of impala just off on the side. They're all happily browsing, grazing. So chances are there's not a leopard in the direct vicinity or immediate vicinity they're very relaxed oh it looks like another giraffe has come down for a drink it's been quite a few days since i've seen some giraffe and then all of a sudden you see lots of them interesting there we are oh, he's already finished he's oh, there's a few of them there's a few giraffe over there. Let's see. Get your giraffe in a row, hey? Not your ducks. There's no ducks. There we go. Three giraffe in a row. There they are, look at that. Lots of swishing tails. I don't Well, giraffe girl, you say two giraffe. What? Um, that must have been before the third one arrived. So three giraffe. Even better than two. Man, giraffe girl, I think that that giraffe getting a little bit irritated with that um, ox pecker right near its bottom. That's why it was swishing the tail. Because I was going to say that it's a little bit windy today. So, I don't, you know, the flies aren't hanging around too badly. Yeah, look at that. It nearly got swatted, eh? Um, and that tail does make for an excellent fly slash bird swatter. I think that's pretty much what those tails are meant for. And they do make very good swatters indeed. Giraffe girl, you say Jurassic Jazz? Well, it does look like that. It's like the um, the ostriches. When I see them running, I always think of Jurassic chickens. Yeah, Ferg says him too. Yeah, I'd, we stopped away off from these giraffe because I'd, I wanted them just to carry on as they would because they're normally quite nervous, quite skittish, and they very quickly move away when you go close. And it looks like they're feeding on a buffalo thorn there. And it always amazes me how they can get right in there with those hook thorns that the buffalo thorn has without getting hooked. Jason, you say, what's a group of giraffe called? Um, well, I would say a journey, but I know that there's another one. What's the other one? Um, it's normally a journey of giraffe, but I know there's something like a dazzle or something like that. A tower, yeah, a tower of giraffe. I think those are the two most common ones used, tower of giraffe or, or journey. Especially when there's lots of them together and they're all moving in the same direction. I think uh, journey is very apt, but tower is very good as well. I, I think at the moment we should say it's a tower of giraffe, but as soon as they all start moving off together, then it would be better to say a journey. Well, maybe this one's going to come towards us. 
you see how their legs also move together they go right left right left very soldier like and it's the exact t uh, type of gait that a hyena has they also move that left right left right so both feet on the right hand side are on the ground when the two on the left pick up and and vice versa so that's interesting to note when you see them walking you must watch that and then when they start running, it shifts to the back on the ground and then the front on the ground. So that's how it does change and very interesting to watch. And this one looks like it's got its head buried in the, in the bushes there. Maybe it's got stuck in there. I highly doubt it, but it just looks like it. Those ox pickers are really enjoying it. There's a lot of them. Now, Chat Noir, you say you really love their patterns. They are very, very nice, unique patterns. Each one very much like our fingerprints, um, very unique, and each one has its very own particular pattern. Similar to uh, Zebra, with each one having its own stripe pattern. And back in the old days, when I was uh, still studying, we used to have to sit and draw these patterns uh, because we didn't have all these fancy phones on every single, um, uh, you know, uh, cameras on all these fancy phones. We used to, there used to maybe be one guy in the entire class that had a camera and his zoom was terrible. So we used to have to sit and watch the giraffe and draw their patterns and then compare them to each other um, between us and then we used to use that as an identification tool with the giraffe. Nowadays you can just literally take screenshots or take photos and then uh, very easy, easily identify individuals as you would do with zebra um, as well as with uh, rhino, with the little nicks and clips in their ears, um, elephants as well. You'd also do their uh, their ear um, drawing, and we also used to have to draw their their footprint um, as we used to get out and trail them, check for their tracks, and then draw um, the track from the cracks that were showing in the track on the ground. So you know, it did take us a lot more um, to to get to a personal identification feature for different individuals but I do think that we learnt those individuals much quicker um, because it wasn't as easy if you see what I mean it was very easy to take lots of photos of the of the animal but until you sort of get to the exact little patterns and everything um, well it might just take you a bit longer to remember it um, that way but uh, I must say the the technology now is incredible um, and since that uh, sort of 2000 uh, year 2000 uh, it's really exploded now Ashley um, their legs yeah they they do bend almost you see in the front it uh, doesn't bend like the flamingos but the ones at the back do but you must remember that there where that tail is that is not the knee that's actually the ankle because uh, these giraffe are standing right on their toes so that where it looks like their ankle down the bottom those are actually their knuckles so it is a little bit um, confusing when you think of that. You see that there? That's like your knuckles. If you make a fist, it's like your, your first uh, appendage up there, uh, over there. And then that first joint, that's the whole foot over there. So that's the ankle. And then you go up a little bit more. That's where the knee is. And then going up into the hip. So it is a little bit um, disproportionate to the way that we normally think um, a foot structure is. So it does bend a little bit like that of a flamingo. Now, Paula, there is a little bit of a way to age them. When you look at their coats like that, when they start to get into their uh, later years, it really starts darkening out quite a lot. So I would say that this one is probably uh, in its late teens or um, early 20s years old, um, and it's heading a, a good age for a giraffe. So...
that is one of the things and then obviously um, you know once they you know the size wise um, you can tell from a year between a year and three years and then between three and eight years um, and eight to twelve and that's pretty much when it would be absolutely fully grown so you can tell between those sizes but it's all relative uh, difficult to uh, you know for the untrained eye to see them uh, on their own to be able to tell uh, their age but when you can see them comparatively next to each other it's quite similar with elephants and then you can make a good judge um, and if you see that a lot then when you see them on their own then um, you, you get more of a trained eye Okay, so these giraffe have been absolutely fantastic, being nicely three in a row, but I think it's time for us to go and look for these elusive leopards. Well, we've been searching and scratching around, and we've just spotted something in the distance. Look who it is. It is indeed the bushwalk team. They heard us coming though, so I knew I was going to spot them here. Taylor has uh, decided she's going to prevent me going any further by lying in the road. So we're just going to let the vehicle make the decision for us. If the vehicle stops beforehand, then um, it is the will of the vehicle. It is the will of the vehicle? I might have to get out and push. <laughs> I might have to push. that heavy it's going it's going at least we can't blame the engine power <laughs> well there we go we've spotted the bushwalk team and obviously they're up to all sorts of, of antics what's happening guys <laughs> so what's your thoughts herbie come around eh come Come, collume into Taylor's hat there, please, Baba. Yeah, I think the mating pair headed west towards Aubrey's. West towards Aubrey's. Yeah. And now we'll be sending you back to the cut line. Okay. To the fire break, and you'll go west. Did someone drive the fire break from here west, this east this morning? Not that I know of. Okay. Because there was an elephant track with a leopard track on top, but it's difficult to tell fresh to say. Yeah. I'm relying on Taylor. Yeah. He'll take me to Okay. Okay, well, you keep going. Keep shouting and let us know. <laughs> Everyone's saying I should take you out, Taylor. How's that? Okay. When are we going for dinner? When are we going? <laughs> oh, is that? Oh, is that? <laughs> take her out for dinner or with no, the car? I'm not quite sure. Listen, I'll go out for dinner, hey? <laughs> <laughs> Catherine won't be sweet, honey. Uh. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to continue this way, okay. and we'll see you guys on the other side. Keep us posted, eh? Craig is hiding. Craig doesn't like to be on the camera, does he? Okay, we'll see you guys soon, eh? Have a good one. Sharp and four. Okay, well, there's some interesting tracks of, it looks like a, a female lying down in the road there. Very fresh. Very, very fresh. Uh... That was quite funny. Okay, so they've given us some instructions on where to go, where to check. Um, but the, the tracks have kind of gone a little bit west. So they're doing a bit of a loop around and we're going to do the same. So stick with us. Who knows what we will find. Remember, folks, this is 100% live. Actually, Luke has just told me in his ear, after your question there about his toe, he says it's looking very good, looking very clean, in fact. We probably should have done a little video on the application of, of the paste onto his toe, but he says it's feeling good and looking good. So, And that's only been a few hours. I think we applied it at about half past ten. He says it feels so much less infected. So, marvellous. The bush medicine. Lots and lots of things out here to discuss. You, well, Luke, you are my first successful patient. No, it's me. Arsenzo was my first patient. I drank tea. You drank a tea. David drank some tea. And, um, yeah, Senzo drank some tea. 
But the first wound that I've healed with false marula, most certainly. Well, we'll see. We'll see what side effects come about. Okay, so this is the road. We're going to go up into Galago again. Okay, yeah, indeed. So we're going to leave us, and uh, we're hoping, as Luke says, he might still be alive tomorrow for another director shift. And in the meantime, I think Ralph is also searching for cats on the other side of Juma. I've got one of those little animals that uh, like to dress themselves up. Not these impala, but those ones up over there. And they, for me, are the animals that do look like they've, uh, they are the best dressed. So let's see if we can get nice and close to them. Because it looks like that same little herd that likes hanging around quarantine. And I hope that we can get rather closer. Sorry guys, I just need to get up this little portion here. Sorry dude. Okay, let's just move a little bit forward. There we go. Right there. How's that? Hello zebras. Looks like everybody's quite relaxed here down in the little wati. Enjoying the afternoon. Feeding party in the little wati. That's it, Fergus. <laughs> it's an aggregation. That's what you call groups of different species of animals in the same sort of area. And the impala are also eating on a bit of grass. You see them there in the background. And there is that one little youngster there. I think that's him. No, I think there is one a bit smaller than that. The one is a little bit younger than the rest. But it's always interesting to note as well. You see with the young uh, zebra, they've got very long legs for their size. And, well, you can, even from when they're a, a, a newborn foal, you can almost not see when they stand up that uh, their belly shows uh, below their mother or the mother's belly. Um, and it does go a long way um, to stop them being identified by predators or being able to single them out. Because if they're standing behind an adult, you won't even know that it's a little baby. That one does look suspiciously rotund like it might be pregnant. Uh, everybody, you guys seem to be quite happy that we've spotted some zebra. Well, I feel excited as well because it's nice to see them around and especially in this kind of light. It's very pretty. And zebra are so photogenic slash videogenic, if that's a word. And they they can be very friendly towards each other, but they can also be terribly nasty. And mostly when you see zebra without tails, that's generally because another zebra has bitten it off. So you see, and it can very quickly go from aloe grooming and sort of nudging and, and um, friendly touchy-touchy to uh, kicking and biting. So don't be fooled and they can kick really hard. Jenny, you say the one looks extra large. Yeah, I think there might be a couple of pregnant individuals here. There's one or two that do look extra large. I think that one... Now, when they do give birth, they'll go off on their own for a, for a couple of days. They'll separate themselves from the herd. Um, and then when they do give birth, they'll stay separated from the herd. And it's just that, you know, period, I think, for mother and child. Um, and they do have that period for what they call imprinting as well. Imprinting each other's um, smell, sound, uh, whether it's color pattern, everything, you know. And they spend quite a few few days and, and a period apart from the herd and a lot of animals do this um, and then after that period uh, very easy for them to uh, identify each other after that and uh, at which stage they rejoin the herd and um, and then it's, it's uh, fantastic as part of the herd. Oh, and Luke uh, says that I should send you over to McCurdy Herdy after these zebras. 
Well, look at what we found. I actually cannot believe it. It's eggs in the grass. Now, there are quite a number of different species of birds that will actually lay their eggs in the grass like this that just make a shallow scrape because there's no sort of defined nest here. And I'm trying to think, for the size of these eggs, I mean, they're pretty big in comparison, you can see, to my hand. So I'm thinking, what about a Cory Bustard? Hey, how incredible is that? Just joking. Cory bastards only lay one to two eggs, but yes, in a shadow scrape, surrounded by tall grass like this, but this is in fact not eggs. I was just teasing all of you. Ha 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 ha. I'm so evil. Anyways, this is hyena dung that we've got here, and it is exceptionally hold. Where's a poo poking stick? <laughs> I fooled the whole of Final Control. I love it when I catch Hulk Final Control. I didn't, Luke fell for my, my trap anyways because he, I didn't even tell him what we had. I just waited for him and then he went, Oh, I thought that was dung, but I see their eggs. And I went, Perfect. The rest of the world is going to fall for this trap too. So thank you, Luke, for falling um, straight into the trap. Anyways, so the reason why it's so white like this, and I actually haven't seen much hyena dung around, is um, is because, of course, a large... Um, portion of hyena's diet um, ends up with them eating bones and uh, they are able to of course digest it I and mean, of course it makes the once in the sun it sort of bleaches white so that's all the excess calcium carbonate that's coming from <clears throat> all the bones sorry I want a little tickle in my throat today and it's very it's very old this stuff this is very hard normally when hyenas defecate it's sort of a lime green in color and then like I guess it as it sits and bakes in the sun it starts to change a bit of color but this is great tortoises are going to come through here maybe nibble on some of this. You often see actually leopard tortoises feasting on um, on uh, lovely hyena dung. I don't think I would eat it, but um, we'll leave it to some of the an other animals, which is quite cool. <laughs> ah, I like it when I catch all of you out. It's my favorite. Watch out, Craig. <laughs> I was just watching Craig as he walked straight. Are you still trapped? Would you like to show everybody what you tripped on? He just walked straight into this. And then almost got caught on this one. Black monkey orange that's growing here. There's a lot of it. Not a very nice area to off-road in. So <clears throat> we have now ventured down off of the, well, the pathways to more of a beaten track and hope to find those leopards. She had me laughing there. I first thought, surely Taylor can't expect Cory busted eggs to be around here. We haven't seen one. We don't really get them. They're quite a sort of very difficult bird to see or to find, especially in these areas. They're like more open grass areas. So I thought, no, she can't have that oversight. How many of you folks fell for it? I wonder. That is hilarious. <laughs> Cory busted eggs. <laughs> I am still, I'm still giggling inside. Well done. Well done. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know what to say. I think it was just well well played, Taylor. Well, we're still checking the road that Herbie asked us to come down. Nothing fresh, nothing um, of interest at the moment. Old track there. Actually, um, not that I know of. You don't know if we pass on the mating. Stuff I'd like to do is uh, this information all is collected, it's all accumulated. But you know, it's whether someone's doing the research. And I, since being here, haven't heard of anyone doing any research. We've been talking about me maybe collecting some of the information. There's 67 years of information around in these areas. And uh, be able to write an enormous amount of papers. But um, generally, research needs to, you know, there needs to be someone interested in someone doing the project. Without there being anyone doing the project, then it's just data. But data being collected is a good thing. I remember a professor of mine telling me that get the data, collect data, collect data, and then later on you can think of your questions. So be very thorough in the data you collect. And then later on you can think of the questions, you know, like how many mating sessions did a male have during his time and how many pregnancies did a female have. And there's lots of books out there. But um, there's still a lot of information required on, on leopards. And there's an enormous amount. Oh. Okay, so, so we do send it to Panthera. Taylor tells me that's Panthera. And also cheats information in the Mara. So I haven't been sending anything through, but yes. Panthera is an organization that's collecting obviously all the big cat information. Panthera is the genus name for... Um, 
for for the lion leopard tiger and jaguar panthera so yes i don't know what they're doing with it but they're probably accumulating it as suggested and then coming up with all sorts of work through that yes wild ho uh, wild dogs and ground hornbills are also collected but that's going to to the ewt uh, Endangered Wildlife Trust is very interested in, in sort of the emergence and appearance of those animals as well as cheetah as well in the Kruger Park. There being a lot of information that they are declining species, the wild dog and the cheetah. So lots of information being passed on there and I'm sure a number of researchers working on those things. But there's always, I mean the Kruger National Park itself is the largest research uh, institution in the world it is enormous and they are doing research on everything everything fire ecology river ecology alien invasives buffalo tuberculosis and lion impact so there's information there's things are changing all the time it's 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 quite hard to keep up with all of it but nice to go to the south african national park sort of seminars where they update you on all the research and all the things that are going on well, we're going to continue on now. We're probably going to be getting towards Sandy Patch, and who knows what animals we might find in those open clearings. Yep, and uh, for me, the search has also, uh, well, never stopped. I'm always looking for leopards and lions and anything exciting. So I'm heading now a little bit more to the west, western part of the Juma Traverse because the bushwalk team and Steve seem to have uh, Tandi Tlalamba area sort of under control there. So there's no need for me to go and look in the same area. We'll leave that to them and spreading out. I'll head in a westerly direction. Go and see maybe some of those lions make a reappearance because it does seem like they have um, crossed out and off of the property. And um, well, we never know when those cheetah could show up as well. So always worthwhile going and checking in that corner. You know, every now and then I just go there and there's some monkeys alarm calling and well, there the cheetah are. So. They seem to be in and around the area, and we never know when they're just going to be walking across onto onto this property. Uh, I mean, for any of the viewers that don't know, um, you know, there's a lot of different landowners in the Sabi Sands, and it's open to the great, to the Kruger National Park itself. Um, so the border on the side of the Sabi Sands then obviously runs onto the border of the Kruger National Park as well. But there's no fence in between, and there's no fence in between the different properties within the Sabi Sands. So when for us, when I say that they've crossed off the property or they've gone out of off of our boundary, it just means that for the traversing area that we have permission to move around on, those animals have moved off of that property and um, well we, we can't for us you know sometimes not cross the road but the animals don't see it as such there's no fence there's no boundary for them so they move in and out and so sometimes obviously it's quite frustrating for us because we can see the cheetah just over there but we can't go any closer but that's the way that this private land sort of agreement works and at least we're open to the Greater Kruger National Park and we're still open to all these private properties as well even though sometimes we're not allowed to uh, drive across the road we can still view those animals and hopefully they walk across onto our property so it's all good and it's actually a fantastic um, arrangement now Jamie you ask how many roads are there within the park wow that's a good question I would actually um, not even hazard a guess because there are so many roads you know 90 percent of them are like this but in the kruger national park itself there's quite a few tar roads and that makes it a lot easier for the general public to come in with their normal sedan vehicles and not necessary to come in with a, a 4x4 um, so but not all of the roads are tarmac like that um, and then obviously you would need some kind of game viewer or, or you know, uh, go on an arranged game drive. Um, but for the amount of roads, uh, there must be 
hundreds if not thousands of little different roads within the whole uh, area and I mean if we look at the whole of the Greater Kruger National Park which is a transfrontier reserve uh, also going across into Mozambique and Zimbabwe um, we're talking an area almost the size of Israel so you can think how many roads there are as well within that um, you know that amount of land uh, 2.2 million hectares is the size of the Greater Kruger National Park. So it's not a small park, not at all. Hello. Okay, so as I said, I'm going to continue on west and hopefully we'll see all sorts of little clues that will lead us towards these leopards. Well, have a look at this. We've come to the edge of a drainage line. It's so cool, it's so steep. Now, Herbie says if we carry on with him, Greg! Greg! That's Craig's bird. Of course, the go away bird, aka the Craig away bird which is what we call it now, shouting at us. I don't think it's shouting at anything else. Anyway, so what I was going to tell you is that Herbie says that there's some bones up ahead. So let's quickly march. I'll go underneath the Tamboti tree. Craig can't go underneath the Tamboti tree. Okay. How far, Herbie? Herbie says it's just up ahead. So let's, before I tell you what has actually happened, let's see if we can find the crime scene. So we're marching. Making Craig walk really fast. Sorry, Craig. So it's really, really steep here. <laughs> Patrick, you've commented now and said thanks for the showing you the hyena eggs. For ha ha ha, very funny. So Herbie was telling me that once the Inkahuma Pride actually chased a buffalo straight off the edge of this drainage line now it's really really steep and uh, that's how they ended up killing it was i think it obviously would have broken a few bones as it landed on down here especially when you're racing away from a pride of lions and then they fed on it down here we can't see any bones yet but it might just be a little bit further around the bend but <clears throat> it's getting quite thick to sort of navigate in there i would one day without of course the equipment because it will inhibit you from walking through the strange line but I would like to come and move around and walk try and walk in here and it could be quite dangerous though because you could find buffalo and elephants feeding in here I reckon there are lots and lots of leopards utilizing this area we've already seen Pudu they ran away from us as um, as suspected and then uh, lots of Stianbok and Dekka and Anyala and Bushbuck too. So we're just going to keep following this and hope that something else pops out. Let's go to Steve, see if, if he's picked up on any more of those leopard tracks. Well, no, it's nothing to report. We've um, done a big loop and Herbie's contacted us again. He said he found the tracks again and they cut back again. So we're doing one little check now along the access back to camp to see maybe if, if there's been any movement back along this very busy section. And uh, in failing that, we're going to go off down towards sort of the, the south and west. See if we can find some elephants. But we'll be in earshot, of course. Because if the tracks don't come out of the block, then there's nothing much I can do with regards to finding them. Apart from driving in circles while Herbie is in there with Taylor trying to follow the tracks. So we'll give it a few more minutes. Actually, it's a really good question. I don't know any specifics with regards to the genetic diversity, but it's pretty good. Um, the leopards are all wild, um, and there's no need to bring any in. There's some tracks there of a leopard that's probably the ones that they're following that have come in. Just show you. Tell me when you got that over my shoulder there, Sands. Is that okay? Over here. Go. There we go. There we go. There you can see a track coming down the power lines road from the west, heading directly into the block where Herbie is. These are the obviously one of the tracks of the male that's moved in. 
So the d genetic diversity up here in the park, I would say is very good. I wouldn't be able to tell you too many specifics. I don't really know too much about that sort of thing, but the variation is really, really good. The, the, the Kruger Park is an enormous area, and leopards in general are very, very sort of, what's the word, diverse species because there's an enormous area for them to move. Okay, well, I don't think they're going anywhere, but we're going to go to Taylor, who's got something very white in the grass, and this time it's not eggs. No, this time it's not eggs or dung. Remember how we were just chatting about uh, that sighting where the ink, well, I don't know if anybody actually saw it happen, but um, Herbie most certainly came to, to view it. There's some of the remains of the buffalo, and that's crazy. That is exceptional. I mean, it just goes to show you how terrified that buffalo must have been being chased by lions, that it would just jump straight off of this cliff to try and get away. And it's, it's a serious drop. It's about three, three and a half meters all the way down there. So three, six, nine, almost maybe just over 10 feet or so. So it's not it's not like it's a small drop. It's um it's a fairly fairly big one. Uh, and there's not much left of it. I imagine it would have been dragged around a little bit though by hyenas and uh, and other predators that would have come to scavenge on it afterwards. But an interesting technique used by those lions. I mean typically what lions will do and most of the predators will do is they'll in fact suffocate their prey. Um or if it's small enough just try and snap their necks. I'm just going to move out so Craig can come out. We'll stand up over here. So to see an animal using a technique like that is amazing. So I'm not really surprised by it. Um, lions are very intelligent animals, and I think that obviously in an area like this where it's not open, it's not the Maasai Mara in Kenya where it's very, very open. They have to use the grass to hide away. Here they've got lots and lots of bush and lots of shrubs to hide around, and if there is something like a drainage line about, why not use it? I think hunting giraffe they'd use a tactic like this if there wasn't any rocky areas drive a giraffe to the edge of a cliff like this um bridget yes i do think that uh, those are maybe from the ribs and there were a couple of other little bones scattered all the way along a couple of vertebrae those are normally what you see um left after after a kill i don't know where the skull is it could i suppose it could be anywhere um i mean as we walk along here we might find more and more of those remains normally when something like a buffalo uh, dies there's quite a few bones to it uh, and the whole area looked like a graveyard and looked like there's three or four animals that actually died there when in fact it was just the one right i know that ralph was also moving into the area and hoped to try and find these leopards well the more the merrier Well, that's exactly what I'm trying to do, Taylor, but um, no such luck just yet. But it's, um, it's about from now, you know, for the next hour or so is the perfect time because this is the time they're going to get up, they're going to walk, they're going to spray, they're going to rasp, they're going to go for a drink. So this is when we really start uh, driving around slowly, keep coming back to a little water hole, you know, because they can just be off the road, a little bit next to a bush, and I think with it starting to cool down as well, that's the time for them to say, okay, I need to start moving, um, it's getting a little bit cool. Sorry about that. We've got some birds just in the grass. They're alarm calling when they're screaming their lungs out. Just here in the long grass. Let's see if we can get them. They're busy shouting. I wonder if any of the viewers back home know what these are. Quite tricky to see them. Let's see if we can get them on camera. He's in there. He's moving around. Here comes one down the road. One on the road, Senzi. Oh, you've got one there. There's a male in the road there. What were they alarming at? They went absolutely ballistic for a second. Now oh, they've kept quiet. Is it because Ralph said it's leopard hour? Did they hear that? Did they hear through my earpiece? I don't think so. So hashtag Safari Live, ladies and gentlemen out there. Tell me what bird this is. It's a very pretty bird. Very, very pretty bird. And they're generally here around camp, just sort of south in the open clearing here. They're very camouflaged indeed, as you can see. They've disappeared. 
It was the mail. Ashley, no, not a guinea fowl. A guinea fowl is very big. Well, a lot bigger, and they got a blue head. Very blue head. This one had a very, the male anyway, had an orange sort of head and throat, and he's probably about a third the size of a guinea fowl. I'll try and get it for you. Try and move up and get another view of them, because it's not often you see them. I've only seen them a handful of times in my entire life, so it's quite a special bird in my opinion. You see guinea fowl all the time. See how they just disappear in this in this grass. It's quite incredible. Linda, you might have heard a lapwing that flew off at the same time as these guys were making their noise. He's just here. Here he is. Now you got a good look at him. Make a little contact call now. Laurie, you have hit it on the button. It is indeed. It is, in, it is indeed a Cokie Franklin. And I'm going to try and find it for you quickly and then play you the call. They actually, they actually make that uh, very nice... They, they call themselves. I'm going to play it for you now. They're saying their name. Very cool. Well, well done. Thank you for playing the game. What bird is that? Haven't seen what it is that sp has spooked them at all. It was probably a slender mongoose or something like that that disappeared into the bushes there, but no sign of a larger cat that we can see. Let's keep going, shall we? Maybe it was even a bird of prey. I just heard a squirrel down the way having a little bit of a word. Hello, Mina Moon. Do you want to know a very good question about why certain birds lay their eggs in the grass and others in a tree? Well, it's all about habitat preference. Um, essentially, the reason why some birds lay eggs in nests is, be is because of uh, just the way they've evolved to do so. And then different types of nests in the tree. And then, I mean, if you have a look around here, let's just, we'll just go back a touch and go back a touch. We're in the savanna right now. And this is what we would call a little bit more of an open savanna. Now, if Senzo just does a little pan from in front of us and around, and have a look at the different habitat types that we have, including just pan all the way this side, Sens. And you'll notice how many trees there are. Lots of trees. But then have a look at how much open ground there is. So if birds, you know, once all the trees were full and there was no more nesting space in the trees, uh, with regards to cavities, because cavities would have been the first obvious nesting site, something natural and easy, just climb inside. Um, then you started getting birds using platforms, very, very easy to build platforms on the top of trees. And then birds started becoming very elaborate in their design, weaving balls, weaving nests, little cups, little purses. It's got very, very elaborate, very, very sort of um, specialized. And then once the trees were full, the competition for the trees was full, um, birds obviously started moving onto the ground. And slowly but surely over time, all the trees were full and the ground was full. So it's just different areas, different ideas. If the trees are full, you need a nest somewhere. So you get a different evolution of bird, a bird that stops flying really all together and spends its time foraging on the ground. Uh, so Franklins, spur fowls, uh, thick knees, corhorns, lots of birds. So they make much more camouflage bird, uh, eggs that you can't even see if you're looking. They're just completely, completely camouflaged, just like the animal Ralph is trying to look for. So, everyone, sorry about earlier. The, I don't know, uh, the gremlins caught up with me, but I was busy trying to say that um, Taylor was talking about um, a, a buffalo carcass or where there were some buffalo um, bones and so on. Um, now, the other day when I was out on bushwalk, we came across this massive, and when I say massive, it's probably one of the biggest um, buffalo uh, pair of horns I've ever seen. Um, alive or dead. Um, unfortunately, this one was dead, 
But, um, well, fortunately from the side that we could get so close to it and actually see how big it was, um, but uh, that was totally incredible and one of, uh, one of the highlights of, of my week, I think, because that was, yeah, it was seriously big. And speaking of bones and so on, um, I visited uh, the other day the, the elephant carcass as well. And it seems like those elephants have continued moving that elephant skull or rolling it. And they, they frequently visit that area. And it is, it's, it's very interesting to see how elephants do that. I've, um, I've seen it many times in the Namib Desert with those desert elephants coming to every site where there has been an elephant pass away and long after even all the bones have been disappeared and dispersed um, those elephants still come to that exact same spot and I used to find their tracks um, that you could see that they'd moved around there for hours and more than one lots of different animals at different times as well and so there's there's a little bit there's a there's something very deep about elephants and their deceased because um, I've also read some literature on uh, on elephants um, uh, in in captivity where elephants have died in captivity um, and that animal then obviously being moved out because you wouldn't let it rot in that in that particular space um, and bringing a new elephant into that spot um, and they have recorded how the new elephant which couldn't have seen or known that there was an elephant die in a particular spot within that enclosure show real interest and almost respect just by the way that the behavior is around that particular area where that previous elephant died. It's um, very intuitive and whether they can smell it or feel it, it's very 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 interesting and um, a book called Elephantums um, a very nice book to get hold of if you'd like to to learn about some small smaller interesting facts about elephants I can't remember all of them in there but um, something else that I've spoken about before was also the uh, link um, that they found between whales and elephants as well and uh, this came down to um, uh, in the Addo Elephant National Park where uh, just near to where I'm from in the Eastern Cape of South Africa that was uh, an area where they used to have a lot of elephants um, naturally and uh, they were hunted uh, almost to extinction and right to the point there was there was only one small herd that was left and with only one bull on his own so it was a small breeding herd that kept to itself and one bull elephant now if you know bull elephants they are quite curious um, uh, in their nature except when they're in must then they just become a little bit aggressive um, but uh, very friendly happy-go-lucky kind of characters and there was one ranger who was sent to go and protect this elephant bull because he was the only one that was left so he was tasked with following him 24 hours a day and walking behind him obviously he couldn't walk holding his trunk he wasn't tame but he, he used to have to follow this elephant and he found this elephant on the beach regularly regularly he found him on the beach um, and he couldn't understand why and later he realized that there were pods of whales that were within earshot um, or within you know a couple of hundred meters from the shore and obviously he wasn't picking up the communication that was going on there because with the elephants sort of very low uh, frequency a lot of it uh, not uh, audible by the human ear and obviously a lot of communication from the whales being very similar um, these two big Ma mammals, massive mammals, were communicating with each other and this bull elephant, very surprisingly, looking for company with the whales. So for me, an absolutely intriguing story. Thanks, Ralph. Yes, marvellous big elephants indeed and the, the funeral displays that they have are quite something to witness. Very emotional. And we're busy viewing a very shy dwarf mongoose and the reason we stopped, obviously because it's very cool, but me and Amu's question about birds and nests and the availability of habitat that we talk about is very important for how animals breed. You know, the habitat is what, it's not just where the animal feeds, 
or spends its time, it's also the availability of breeding sites. And like these dwarf mongoose, they need burrows, they need holes, they need cracks in order to proliferate. And without that in their habitat, they, you won't find them there. So when it comes to birds uh, and birds nesting on the ground, they are very, very ancient, actually, the nesting on the ground type species. And they probably evolved at a time when there was no actual predators in and around. So moving into the trees became something a little bit later. Um, as that availability became about, you know, trees probably came a bit later as well, different types of trees and the proliferation of these species. So the birds on the ground became more cryptic, more camouflaged, and quite interesting how you can find some eggs on the ground. I found some eggs of a, of a white-fronted, of a, of a lapwing. I'm trying to remember which lapwing now, on a beach next to a river. And I went back probably 30, 40 meters to my guests to bring them to show them. And it took me half an hour to find those eggs again. They were so camouflaged. So the evolution of these birds, their nesting, all comes hand in hand with how they've evolved in their habitat and how their habitat has changed. Very interesting indeed. Well, beautiful dwarf mongoose. Yes, Leah is probably one of his houses. They will move between burrows. There's a number of termite mounds in and around, and little holes in the ground, and they will use them for, for sleeping, for living, for escaping predators. And we have a migrating herd that is just arriving on the left-hand side. They're moving in towards my territorial boundary from the other day. If you're watching the show the other evening, they're walking directly towards where I marked my, set, my territory. I did use another wildebeest's dung at the time. But at the same time of day, they're coming to see who the new dominant male is. How marvelous. You can see the youngsters coming in on the right of the screen. A couple of them there. I just love this wildebeest family. In the woodland habitat. They love these open areas. Nice short grazing grass. Distance for them to see. Outrun their predators. And I wonder if they're coming to investigate the midden and the scraping that I was practicing only two days or so ago. So we're playing games with everybody, so I don't know why I'm in such a comical mood today. But I grabbed Herbie just now by his shirt and I pulled him closer and then I just started presenting. And then even Craig started panicking and camera was up very quickly, thinking that we'd gone live and he hadn't heard. I was talking a whole lot of nonsense, but we hadn't. Okay, so we're going to do something which I've been wanting to do for a little while since I discovered um, this new spot. So... We're not there yet. It's going to take us a little while to get there. So hopefully the next time you come to us, we're going to sit. Where are we going, Herbie? Which way? We're going to go this way. We're going to go the shortest route because we are losing light now. And uh, unfortunately, we sure can't stay out all the time. But it could be quite nice. I'm hoping we might get a few little birds come around. But we're going to go and sit. And we're going to just watch and just see if there's any animals about. So we're careful, Craig. Craig's doing more slipping than I normally do. Shame. So we're just going to walk on the road because we're about to pop out at Gallagher Pan. And, uh, and then sort of from there we'll make our mission to the new secret spot, which is going to be really, really quite cool. Uh, we don't know what's happened to those leopards. Herbie thinks they may have gone east now because we did pick up some more male leopard tracks walking along that same drainage line where we saw all the buffalo bones, or a few buffalo bones. Um, and then, but they went that way. So we can't keep following now because the sun's going to go down. And then the other thing we, we tried to do, which was really quite funny, was try and get another night jar on camera. There's so many of them just roosting in a drainage line. Of course, it's nice and cool. It's fairly dark. We know night jars don't like the daytime. They're nocturnal birds. Um, so and it was quite epic, but it kept flying away. And we also didn't have the greatest signal, unfortunately. Yeah, good. I'm glad you're all excited for the surprise. I'm hoping it's going to work. If it doesn't work now, then I know that I need to start here on bushwalk. So we'll, we, we're in the testing phases at the moment. Okay, 
we're gonna we're almost there so hopefully the next time you come to us I'll show you my little surprise but uh, while we walk a couple more steps off you go to Steve yes well thanks Taylor the wildebeest have all stopped and we're having a proper little smell around the midden that I was enjoying the other day and what they did do is they moved in and one male in parlor had a look at them and it ran off in fear of its life which is normally what happens Impala are far smaller and less superior than wildebeest. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Anyone getting my joke? Probably not. <laughs> but it's interesting because there's no big bull, bull, bull there. Uh, this is a herd moving back in. And they've come in to maybe investigate the new male in the area, being Steve Orville. But it's possibly they're clearly threatened clearly threatened but also the fact is that just over from where we can see them now we had tracks of the wildebeest this morning on the road on that side of tracks running and the Unkuhumas were in that section there so they probably ran quite far to get to where they are now so we're going to head back in that direction see if any any lions maybe come in that side but maybe they're coming in and they're just looking going are well, the lions here because they they spotted them last night at some point or smelt them and so then they've moved off and now coming back into this open clearing for the night. They want to make sure that it's all open and all safe before they go into their wildebeest slumber. All right, so we've come all the way west and now I'm heading uh, from the western boundary. We are here now quite close to Sydney's dam which is just on the other side of the property but where we've often found the cheetah um, that were indicated by the monkeys. Now I just want to switch off just for a second and just see if we might get lucky because just down over that uh, thicket there there's a little water hole we can't really see it that clearly or we can't see it at all really but um, there is a water hole there and there are some monkeys that live around here as well so if there's any predator activity they will be the first to know and they very quickly tell us as well so this is where we've found the cheetah family moving in um, on all the times that they have come onto the property so always worth just a quick browse for now it does seem to be a little bit quiet but, well, that's the way the cookie crumbles. Nothing for now. Quiet, quiet, quiet. Now, Edwin, um, there's a couple of animals that I think are extremely intelligent. First and foremost, I would have to say an elephant because um, of their renowned intelligence. and. How do we judge intelligence? Well, one of the, the best ways that I believe or that I've heard of, and uh, unless I'm told otherwise, um, is uh, the amount the brain can grow from when it's a baby to when it's an adult. Now, a human's brain, as being the most intelligent um, uh, species on the planet, uh, when you're a baby, your brain is 10% the size of when you are an adult, fully grown. So you, your brain grows 90%. Um, and I think an elephant is something like 80, 75 to 80% the growth size um, from when it's a baby to when it's an adult. Um, a very intelligent animal. Another one being that of the hyena. I don't think quite as uh, intelligent as, as an elephant, but one of the most uh, uh, intelligent animals out here nonetheless. Uh, honey badgers as well, very intelligent, but I mean you could still put theirs at about 60% uh, growth. Um, and, and so still very intelligent animals. Um, whereas for instance if you had to look at something like an impala, I think um, I think it's only something like 30 percent their growth um, so from when they're a baby till when they're an adult they only have 30 percent growth so the baby's brain is 70 percent the size of it is uh, when it's an adult 
um, and just goes to show that it's 70% um, instinct, 30% learned behavior. Um, because also I would say that intelligence is also down to how much you can learn um, as opposed to just being instinctive. Like an ostrich, I mean its brain is only the size of my little finger's nail, um, the size of a pea, and I would say it's probably 99% um, the size of when it's a chick to when it's an adult, so it's got 1% learned capacity. I'm not exactly sure on the numbers, I'm, I'm sort of guesstimating, um, but I'm pretty sure an ostrich uh, doesn't have uh, too much intelligence, to say the least. <laughs> Ashley, you say it's time I give up on night lectures. Okay, I'm uh, just trying to keep it interesting, but uh, if you're not enjoying it, well, I'll keep quiet. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, you want to, you want me to start on night lectures? All right. Sorry, I thought you were telling me to shut up, which I can do as well. <laughs> I can just drive, but um, if you'd like me to carry on, that's okay. <laughs> but we're looking for leopards and I'm just trying to fill the space in between while Fergus keeps the crow's nest hairy eyeballs going on in the back there looking for our spotted cats and lions if we can so I've, I've checked this sort of western boundary I'm, um, <laughs> I'm going to head to a little bit more south from here, but um, you guys are, are, are surprised at how silly or you know, I say stupid um, ostriches are, and that's no discrimination towards ostriches at all. I've just uh, I've, I've assisted in, in hand raising uh, some ostriches, and I've also been privy uh, to a lot of them in the Namib Desert, and they are they're very silly. Um, if, if I can, and that's putting it uh, nicely, because if, you, if, I mean, for instance, if you drive up behind an ostrich, slowly, um, you get a fright that you're behind him, so you're obviously do, not trying to give him a surprise or anything. Anyway, so he gets a surprise and he starts running away, which is fine, so you sort of try to drive past him, but he's running next to the road and he'll speed up. Um, next to you and you land up that this ostrich is running right next to you and when you speed up he speeds up He's trying to run away from you, but he's running next to you I mean all he had to do all he has to do is stop or turn off into the bush, but he will run next to you um, And at sometimes I've actually had to stop the vehicle and let him run away because I, I would think I'm gonna exhaust this guy um, Yeah, and as I say Jurassic chickens they are literally like beat hot, beat hot, eat grass. Run, beat hot, beat hot, eat grass. Right, somebody that's um, a lot more intelligent than an ostrich, um, but maybe similar eyelashes is Taylor. Thank you, but I can't run as fast as them, so I'll keep working on it. Anyways, we're at my secret spot now. Now, it's not really a secret. Lots of go-away birds around today shouting, Cray! Anyways, um, basically we're right by the new accommodation that was built for us. You can see it's just through there. And literally all that's separating this little area that we're in now with the room is a little elephant wire. So it's not really going to stop anything. Buffalo can walk under there. So can hippos. Leopards and lions. Hyenas all the time spend much, much time around the camps. Now, with camps comes a lot of water. We manicure the gardens, there's a lot of irrigation, we're constantly watering them. And then this water that you can see here, this is actually grey water. So obviously living out in the bush, it's it's fairly difficult, um, you know, what do you do with all your grey water? So normally what big lodges do is uh, they will feed it into a wetland system where there's lots of reeds, lots of, well I suppose papyrus is a typical one that grows around there, and a variety of sedges. And they actually help to remove some of the harmful toxins that would be say in shampoos and things like that, and then the rest of the water sort of filters out back into the environment. And that's exactly what's happening here at the moment. So there's no smell to this water, and you can see by all the, well I suppose all the depressions in the ground, that's all antelope tracks, bushbuck, 
water buck. I saw some buffalo tracks just a moment ago. Uh, lots of vinyala, you can imagine. Even the Impala, De Castellanbrook will come down here. And I think that they would prefer to use a spot like this rather than Gallego Pan because Gallego Pan, you're very exposed. You're walking out into the open. You can be spotted. Here, for something like an Inyala bushbuck, those secretive antelopes, it's easy for them to take a couple of steps out of the bushes and come and have a drink of water. Leah, yes, it is very beautiful, and you can see that the, this water is not really doing any harm to the environment. All the grass is nice and green around here. The plants are absolutely thriving. Now, Gallego Pan is also another pump pan, but I've definitely noticed that the animals are choosing this section to come and drink from rather than even the fresh water at Gallego Pan. So it's very interesting. As we head into winter now, this is going to become a serious hotspot. Now, I think I've got my timing wrong here. I think next time I do a bushwalk in the afternoon, I'm actually going to start here and we're going to sit and we're going to watch all the birds that come round. But I think it's just a little bit too late for the birds. But um, we were obviously excited by the leopard tracks, so uh, we wanted to follow up on them a little bit. But I suppose next time we can spend half an hour here, hopefully in the next week, which I think would be quite exciting. As I was sitting just outside Eggsy's room, Zander, who's the editor, we were sitting there and we had all sorts of creatures. We had like little uh, long-billed crombecks only a couple of meters away from us, which was absolutely amazing. So, and some sunbirds. So very exciting things to come and hopefully a lot of antelope too. But uh, Rolf has got a mammal smaller than a steel What was it? Okay, everyone, we've just um, stopped here where there's a little mongoose. Um, almost den site I would say this this fall down over a tree it looks quite hollow and I'm just waiting to see if one or two of them show themselves again because there was a number of them that disappeared into this log and so we'll just wait and see we can hear their little grr, grr. and that's normally a good sign because they um that's the all clear sort of call but whether they show themselves or not is a different question. It's about that time when they might uh, actually go to sleep. So once they go inside the den, that might be the last we see of them because they all huddle up and keep warm through the winter, uh, through the night. And on a winter's morning, here comes one. And he's just made himself his way onto the log. There he is underneath. There he's jumped up. Oh, he's on top. Stuck his head over the top there just for a millisecond. And, uh, he's moved off again. A little bit of wait and see. No, I think they've all gone in for the night. Maybe one or two stragglers, but I think that's about it. Okay. Oh, some flies there on the quarry. Making for beautiful light, eh? Once again, that sun heading towards the horizon. So it's that golden hour. It's pretty as, with some of the cobwebs in between and, and these quarry thickets. This is where Shudulu and Hukumuri like hanging out when they are on our property. And the lions do move through here as well. So that's why I'm just moving through here slowly and Serb, uh, um, Ferg, sorry. Serb. <laughs> Seb and Ferg, it's Serb. Um, I'm just being artistic there with the cobwebs. <laughs> All right, I think that's enough artistry there, Ferg. Let's move on and see if we can find some, some um, kitty cats. And while I'm doing that, I think we'll just work out what's going on with these radios while you head off to Steve. Mmm, the sun is setting. Probably time the bushwalk team is heading back. Taylor hasn't told us before about her secret spot. I suppose that's why it's called a secret spot. But she has shared it with all of you. How lucky indeed. There we go. That's a bird just landed up there, Sens. I wonder if you can catch him quickly. I know James Richards been asking where have the grey hornbills gone. They are around, James. We just don't get them in shot. There's still plenty of them around. They're not making too much noise. There he's also enjoying the sunset on top of a 
leafless marula. Time for a bit of grooming, perhaps, before heading back to the nesting site. And there we go, into the setting sun. They fly. We'll have a quick look at that. Are we not in the best spot, Sens? It's quite nice through the trees, in fact. Oh, stole my car. Joshua, no, it's not common practice. Um, you want to know about muting animals? Sense, how's that, eh? Can we see that through the bushes there? Is that all right? Just going to try and line the sun up for you there, folks, while we talk about Joshua's very interesting question. Um, obviously, Joshua, it's quite common practice for, for people to, to deal with domestic dogs and cats through ways of sort of spade and neutering. But when it comes to wild animals, it's not something that's very common. Um, in small reserves, they have been known to sort of do sort of neuting or what you'd call it spade sort of on, an, on elephants to reduce their numbers because they're in areas that aren't able to expand. But um, the, the ramifications of reducing females to non-breeding is, is quite incredible and um, it does affect them in the long run does affect them in the short term as well because females are generally female elephants are generally always pregnant and if not pregnant they are are breeding in some form or with babies so so no it's not not common practice but essentially we do have reserves and we do have areas that are are limited in size and on some of the smaller reserves there is contraception and things in elephants and in lions to prevent their numbers from getting out of control um, because of the size of the area um, so, but not common practice. But if you are a small landowner and you have a few lions, they do try and keep their numbers low by preventing them from breeding. But that is just one of those things, I suppose. But very good question. We're going to move off. We're on our western side now, where we left the tracks of the Unkuhumas crossing west this morning. Maybe they're going to cross back over east. Well, yep, it's, um, it seems like we're following on to where these animals were and have been seen because um, there's nothing at the moment that is uh, making me jump and drive in a particular direction. I'm just moving in their old uh, traditional move, you know, routes that they've been moving in. A uh, little bit difficult, uh, even this morning, um, to find any of the cats. So we seem like we're chasing ghosts or chasing our tails. That's not a problem. You know how it goes. The ebb and flow, and when it's quiet, sometimes you are, you're almost thinking, when is it going to explode? Because that's how it almost happens. It's very, very quiet, and then all of a sudden, everything's happening at once. Now, super bikes. Um, I believe the evokers have moved north again um, onto Biffle's Hook. So they're up that side. Um, whereas the, the Birmingham's sort of have moved quite a lot south um, and we've got quite a big vacuum in this area you know for the male lions so it's still going to be interesting to see how it all plays out I think that the evokers are just going to move in um, and not uh, I mean we were chatting about it earlier and uh, with the guides and uh, doesn't oh hello Mr. Warthog oh, and of course there he goes oh fatty that's been wallowing in the mud now I got a fright when I stopped he was absolutely fine when I was driving it's always surprising eh, how they react towards the vehicle sometimes also when you switch off the vehicle that they get a surprise it's almost just that change in noise or something um, but uh, yeah it seems that it's not a real fight or the vocas that are pushing the Birmingham's out um, it just seems that the Birmingham's have moved south because there's an opening down there and it's better territory for them, maybe more food, more animals for them to eat. And so there's a bit of a vacuum that it's allowed the evokers to sort of move in and, and out as well. So not real conflict, I don't think. And the last time we did see the Birmingham, I saw the Birmingham's, the one had a very big um, a wound, a couple of big wounds on it, but it seems like through the social media of the different properties, Londolozi, Mala Mala, um, 
it, it seems that uh, they're actually just fighting between themselves. Now, it seems like there's lots of gremlins, so I'm going to sort them out and send you over to Steve. I wonder if we can cure Ralph's gremlins with some medicinal plants we find out here. We reckon, Sens? I think it's doable. Yeah. I'm not sure, eh? Gre Gre Ralph got some pro pro proper gremlins. <laughs> I saw the video of him thrashing his impala horned head in the bush the other day. Some of you viewers who came on late must have thought he's lost his mind. Well, I can confirm he has indeed lost his mind, but I think that's just the way he is, in fact. But um, then there's a cure for, for losing one's mind. But well, we do apologize for the gremlins Ralph is experiencing. Certain technical issues in, in areas of the reserve. I believe he was out by Sydney's dam area up in the northwest. It's quite renowned for, for losing a bit of signal. Okay, so this is where the Uncle Hoomers came in. I think that's where they came in. I'm just going to jump off. A little scratch around to see how fresh these are. Maybe they've come in again. These don't, these don't look as fresh as this morning. So yeah, they came in from that side. You can see the tracks. I don't know if you can see. Where are you there, Sansi? There's one, two. You can see that there. This is a little bit more clear. That's the whole pride that came in yesterday, sometime in the night. They came in, they walked back over that direction towards where they scared the life out of those wildebeest and then we tracked them all the way around and they went out again that way. So up and down, up and down. That's definitely the movement of a hunting animal or a moving animal in search of food. Lions move in search of drinking and food and if males are calling, either to intercept the males or to run away from the males. There's the only reasons really why lions move. They don't have to pay tax or go to the shop or do anything of of other interest but we're going to keep following just double check where it is exactly they come out but i'm sure these are the same tracks as this morning no what you are looking is to wait we're just talking about a moment ago you can see it just there so it's important of course Oh, it's a funny afternoon. The gremlins seem to be quite active. So I'm going to head into a very safe zone now where we're not going to get any of them. Um, and just keep looking, keep looking. Sun just about popped down over the horizon there. Yes, it has. Sorry. There we go. The bump as well. And it's just about gone now, but it is still very beautiful. I think I might spin around here and we just have a quick look at the horizon with the Drakensberg in the background. It is very pretty. So let's have a quick look here. Right about there. Look at that. That is a wonderful sight. As that sun has disappeared, but that's beautiful orange glow. And with the Drakensberg there, this is one of the best spots on Juma, I think, for, for that sunset uh, time. Get a beautiful view of the Drakensberg there. And the sun sort of sets just off to its right. So it makes it makes for a beautiful setting. And if I was a guide here, I think I would come here for sundowners. If I was a Juma guide... Well, I am a Juma guide, thanks, Ferg. But if I worked from one of these lodges with um, with actual guests sitting on my vehicle, not watching by video, I think this is where we'd stop for our little drinks and snacks stop and then head on after that to go and look for the nighttime critters. So, well, that's what I'm doing for you. So you can take your drink at home, whether it's an apple juice or a beer, or a soft drink, whatever you might have, and have yourself a little bit of popcorn. And uh, well, we would normally have uh, drovors, which is like dried sausage, a very traditional South African snack, um, or biltong, which is uh, uh, a little bit like jerky, but um, much better. And uh, yeah, so 
<laughs> and I know Americans might say otherwise, but um, well, uh, yeah, it's made slightly differently. And 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 um, in South Africa, it's quite a uh, what do they call that that word? Um, like caviar. What is caviar? It's um, uh, not a. It's a connoisseur's sort of uh, snack. What is that? It's an, not an acquired taste. It's um, uh, what is the word? Oh. Del delicacy. There we go. Thanks, Fergus. I knew you'd be able to find it for me. It's a delicacy in South Africa. Is um, biltong and druivors. There's the moon. It is in uh, waxing uh, first quarter. And there it is up there, and you can still actually almost make out the entire ring. Okay, that's going to be a little bit of a bump there, Fergus. Just leveling out. Sorry for that, but we're going to come back to it now. There we go. Anna Marie, the Drakensberg, it's probably about, at about 60 kilometers from here, is it that? I don't think it's any more than that, 50 to 60 kilometers. So not very far at all. Um, and then it does obviously extend a little bit further and all the way down into KwaZulu-Natal, um, and into Lesotho as well. So this is um, the most easterly part of of the the Drakensberg. But look at that moon! Wow! You see all the craters there and everything, eh? Almost heading towards half moon. But that is stunning. Very pretty. Nice one. So oh, beautiful sunset and a lovely moon setting. And so, well, looking up into the sky and with the moon out, I think it's now time for us to start looking for those nighttime critters. Yes, well, is that a challenge, Ralph? Are we seeing who can find the big cats first? Well, I'm not going to challenge. I'm just going to go and find them because it is indeed that time. And it's all about who is the lucky one. Because right now the skill in finding leopards or lions all comes about the correct road. And it's a bit about gut. Okay, so the Unkuhumas definitely came in. They came in and they looped around. They were hunting in this block over here. And then they went out. So these are with the tracks that David and Nishi found this morning and have then since moved. So, no, they haven't come in again, but we might be lucky with something else. We're going to head on towards Vuyatela watering hole. You know how lucky that can be, and maybe, hopefully, we get there before Ralph. Wherever he might be. Still moon gazing, I suppose. Ashley, yes, indeed, the, the prides. Um, let me show you, because I know you're quite new to the show, Ashley. So this is our area, Juma. This is our area over here. But uh, bearing in mind, there's no fence around it. So on the east, on the west here, there's another, another reserve, kind of different lodges there. In the south, there's different property. Uh, on the east here, we get access to Torchwood, and the north is Bivelshoek. But all of this forms just a small part of an enormous ecosystem, the Greater Kruger National Park in the Sabi Sands. And so what the prides do is they move. They just come in, and because there's no fence, they just kept, they move. So they came in from over here. They came in over there, they went out that way. And so they're somewhere here at the moment, and then they're going to come in again and go over there, and then go up there. So there's actually, there's limited amount of space that they're going to move in, but by no means do we own all that area or the traverse to be able to cover that sort of area. But they do move in enormous areas, and um, there's prides up in the, the east here, there's another prides up in the north, there's another pride that hangs out sort of down this way, but how their movements move, it's very sort of sporadic, but there are sort of boundaries between them that they know about, but sometimes you find the others encroaching. Uh, we had another pride called the Sticks, they came right in and they killed something over here, and during the day while it was still hot, they went all the way back out again. I moved very quickly there. They moved all the way back out again before the, 
the Unkuhumas, which are the sort of, we could say, the general pride of Juma before they came back. So they kind of snuck in, obviously hunting. That same sort of area we had the wildebeest earlier, they came in and they managed to kill one of those wildebeest and then moved out without paying for their dinner. So that is kind of the way it works. And it's very interesting, the dynamics of lions and how they move. Very interesting. Oh, sorry, did you hear that? That was a red-crested Kohan. Red crested Kohan is known as the suicide bird because they'll do that call and then if answered or not answered they'll fly up and do this backward somersaulting backflip which can be quite something to see. I've never got it recorded like that on camera. Have you Sens? Senzo has got it. I've only been here since January. This is going to be my first winter with the Kohan so hopefully because every now and then you just see this balloon pop out in the distance and it's really quite special because the ladies are watching these guys and so they're being very deliberate in there. They fly up and they just fall out the sky backwards and apparently that's sexy. I don't know. It works for them. Works for them. But they first announced their call by that very loud high pitch. <laughs> My lips are a bit dry to be acting like a red crescent corn, but we're going to continue on down this road. No doubt we'll be in spotlights very soon. Well, everyone, this is the area where those cheetah were also found recently. So that's why I'm just coming past here. Um, still in the very western part of the Juma Traverse. Um, and just moving through the, the little spots, just in case. I know, you know, if we had to spot cheetah now, it would be a little bit unfortunate because we can't put the spotlight on them so we would have to just literally have a little quick look and then move on because um, you know cheetah daytime um, animals and there's also two cubs with the with the cheetah as well and cheetah are very susceptible to being attacked by leopard and lion and so you put the light on them uh, it can change their habit a little bit um, and make them a little bit stunned and or you know a bit like a rabbit in the headlights and make them susceptible to to these bigger predators even hyenas as well so um, never spotlight cheetah at night and but it would just be nice to know that they're back here on the property because then we come look in the same area again tomorrow not that i'm not going to do that anyway but um, there's a little pearl spotted owlet calling it's just stopped as i said that though he started up again And you notice also that the fork-tailed drongos, they can often mimic those um, pearl-spotted owlets. Why? Because the pearl-spotted owlet is quite a ferocious little hunter. And um, especially when there's um, a lot of birds coming in like a bird party, um, and it's normally for some food or something like that. Maybe there's um, uh, termites or flying ants, the alates, they're starting to come out. And the little trickster, uh, the fork-tailed drongo, he'll call like a um, pearl-spotted owlet so the other birds think there's a, a predator around and they might move off or get a little bit edgy and then he gains the upper hand. So he is a real trickster, is the fork-tailed drongo. He can mimic most birds. Then what are, the, what are other mimicking birds? Uh, the chorister robin, very good mimicker as well. Um, I'm just trying to think now. Forktail drongo, chorister robin, um, the Indian miner can be trained uh, to mimic uh, or speak better than a parrot. Um, so there's some good, very good mimickers out here. Right. Sure sooner. <laughs> you guys impressed with my mimicking? Well, I've had a bit of practice and I, and I sometimes really am terrible with the bird calls, but sometimes I just get the little ch the, the, the tune uh, nearly right. And if you get it ready, I've seen guys that are so good that they can mimic a pearl spotted owlet with that whistle and um, it's almost exactly the same as the call that, that especially when they're in their breeding season um, and it brings a little pearl spotted owlet in. 
The, the one that I'm good at is just a simple um, uh, small bird uh, alarm call, which is a psh, 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 but almost anyone can do that. And that often works too, to bring them in, um, to, because it's like a mobbing alert call. When there's a snake or something like that in a little uh, bush, and then you hear lots of the little birds going there, psh, 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 and it brings them all in, in a collective sort of fight against a, a common enemy, like a snake. There's some big termite mounds around here, hey? Uh, Lara, um, birds will mimic other bird calls. For for instance, like I mentioned with the uh, forktail drongo, it can be to gain the upper hand when there's uh, a food resource available, but there's so many birds on it that the forktail drongo gives a predator call and that then means that the other birds get a little bit edgy and it gives them the upper hand to go in and get that food. Um, it can also be to uh, bring in, uh, you know, like a forktail drongo, not so good in, in calling little birds in for that mobbing type behavior. So he can also mimic the distress calls of other small little birds to get them in to come and help to attack a snake or, you know, it might be a mongoose or uh, even a honey badger doing that. Psh, 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 psh. Um, so for, it's normally for those different reasons. And... Uh, and there's a, there's a couple of different uh, well-established mimickers and that's mainly the reasons that they do it to, to try and, um, uh, what do you say, um, I forget, the manipulate, manipulate the birds in, in different ways to your favor. So that's why they might do it as well. There we go. I've been struggling for a couple of words tonight. I wonder what's going on. Okay, so I'm just about ready to get my um, infrared light on and uh, also get my spotlight out. So I'm going to get that going and um, well, yeah, that's all. He, he might be struggling for some words, but he's still got lots of them, doesn't he? <laughs> he still have lots of words, Rob. It must be those gremlins, must be the gremlins. So we have got our lights on, spotlight not quite out yet. Just trying to see the last little bits of light as it comes. We're going to slowly make our way towards Vuatela watering hole. Or you, those of you manning the dam cam, are you listening to the audio off of the dam cam? Can you hear any alarm calls? It's been a week since I've heard anything off the dam cam since. Not from the visual aspect, there's been lots of sightings of animals, but no calling or shouting. Impala alarming, Impala shouts, Nyala shouting. That's what we're looking for now, or listening for now. Oh, lioness, that's the, a very, very interesting question. Well. You know, with the evoker males coming in, if they do stay, if the Birminghams allow them to move in, um, it's very sad, the consequences for cubs, very, very sad, what could, could potentially be. I don't want to be the one to say it, but, um, you know, lions generally, male lions generally kill cubs. Not all of them. Um, in the genetic population, if you are a lion, who kills cubs, you will have more cubs than one that doesn't. And they believe that that sort of trait is kind of passed down. So if a lion doesn't kill cubs, then they invariably breed less. They have less cubs, so there's less of those non-cub killing lions in the population. So that's essentially what happens. I don't know who the evokers are really. I don't know who their dads were, but it is something that happens in lion dynamics. It's, it's very common these days, very sad. Very, very sad, but uh, we haven't even seen her cubs yet, but Michael has been documenting and trying to figure out exactly when um, the Birminghams were with Amber Eyes, and that was in, in late January before I went up to the Masamara. So he's kind of worked out that if she did fall pregnant in that mating session, that she's probably, it's probably going to be a few, a, a while still until they're moving at all. and. Um, Taylor believes, I think she's got some information from the West, that they are 
she is denning somewhere exactly where they keep coming back to that area just on the other side of of triple m boundary in our west hmm, maybe i'll go this way first i've got a feeling i've got a feeling that's that that feeling you get in the tummy as a guide you've got to follow that always got to follow it, it might be nothing might be something might be a spotted individual okay well we're going to be heading down through the drainage towards Gallego Pan and then after that towards Vuyatela and who knows what we'll find well everyone I've just uh, stopped here uh, next to this uh, marula tree and there's that wonderful nest of these uh, birds of prey or raptors and uh, up there there it is as we go in and just below that's a mistletoe and that is underneath uh, that a parasite on the marula now I've been here a few times and I, I still can't quite work out whether that's a chick uh, white-backed vulture or whether it's a an adult sitting on eggs so I'm still interested to find out or work it out um, because uh, I'm not convinced either way because I'm pretty sure that I did see a little youngster but um, uh, yeah for the life of me I can't remember so if anybody does know any better than me please feel free to send in the answer to hash, uh, hashtag safari live on Twitter um, but um, yeah the debate can also open is it isn't it well, we'll just have to keep coming back uh, to see it will be nice if it is an adult sitting on little eggs and if we get to see the little babies when they hatch um, either that or it is um, a sort of just prior to fledgling because it is a rather big bird that's sitting there but it could be a youngster either way it's nice to be near to a vulture's nest it's always nice so it's a very quiet evening actually the um, the daytime birds and the nighttime birds both haven't started calling now Brian you sure that it's a baby um, I would I would agree with you Brian but um, I'm still not convinced that it's not an adult either because I often find it sitting here and I haven't seen any of the adults then uh, if it were a baby sitting with it so I'm just um, I'm just speculating but I'm not saying that you're wrong Brian not at all okay and that's still actually very pretty as well with that horizon like that okay I'm gonna start up and go now Rory you're asking what is my favorite vulture I have to say Rory that uh, that would definitely have to be the Lamachai or the uh, bearded vulture that uh, you find in the Drakensberg regions and uh, most specifically or more so in Lesotho um, or a little bit on the edge of the South African side of the Drakensberg as well um, but the real mountain part uh, of the Drakensberg is really situated in Lesotho and uh, I've seen quite a few of them in there now go and look up a, a Lamachai or the bearded vulture one of the smaller vultures looks a little bit probably the closest vulture that looks like a Lamachai is the palm nut vulture now Gemma yes the vultures do make their own nests sometimes they can use uh, a platform uh, that they might find whether it be a hammercorp nest um, or you know something else that is created a nice big platform uh, I've seen them also nesting on top of sociable weavers nests in Namibia um, so that making a nice big platform for them to then bring in their own sticks and uh, place it down they also do nest on cliffs um, so they need a sort of quite a, a flat platform for them to then put those uh, sticks and so on on because eventually you're landing up with um, you know three or four uh, rather large individual birds sitting on the same spot so um, it, it, it needs to be a relatively broad base and able to hold quite a bit of weight otherwise these little chicks when they are sort of half grown uh, they can be 
sort of yay big um, and, and weigh quite a bit. And if it wasn't strong enough, so you'd, you'd have them landing on the ground. So, and then uh, not very easy for them to get up uh, the tree before they'd be able to fly. So you'd have quite a big mortality rate if you didn't have them choosing the right site. So important for the site to be chosen well by the adults. Um, and that obviously also comes down to um, evolution, natural selection, survival of the fittest. It's those vultures that choose the best nesting sites um, genetically that carry through. Because you see how the evolution works? It's uh, a natural selection. Um, a very interesting subject then. Those, uh, those traits continuing through. I don't know what happened there. Sorry, Luke, can you just repeat that? I'm getting a little bit of a problem with my earpiece. Okay, Linda, you're asking if we have Cara Cara here, the falcons. Uh, no. Linda, I think, where are those from? Are they from... Um, are they... They're not New Zealand. I know that um, there's a bird similar to that... Um, that I think that you get in New Zealand or Australia. Um, but we don't have Cora Cora falcons. We have um, Lana falcons, peregrine falcons. Um, Luke saying they come from the American forests. Uh, so that's where they are from. We don't get them here in South Africa. Um, and uh, so we have Lana falcons, peregrine falcons, eastern red-footed falcon or the Amur falcon. Um, we have the Sooty falcon um, and, an, and, a, and a couple of others. And then we have kestrels. Um, and uh, so these are all the short-winged birds that, um, you know, are... I, I have a few friends that do a bit of falconry and, and um, I've learned the difference between a short wing uh, predator and a long wing predator. The falcons and the kestrels being short wings, so they use height to then um, get massive pace uh, from coming down, from gravity basically, and coming down behind uh, their target and then hitting it with speed, whereas um, the long wing predators like the, the sparrow hawks and the goshawks, um, they literally uh, chase down prey. So they don't go up in the sky and then use gravity to uh, come in behind uh, and smack the, the prey like that. They actually go off a perch and chase it down. And, and so the prey also is slightly different then as well. With the, with the, um, with the falcons, you're looking at Franklin, um, guinea fowl, and stuff like that, um, whereas uh, with the with the sparrow hawks uh, and goshawks, it's more like your guinea fowl and um, thick knees, etc. So very very interesting um, the different kinds of prey. Thanks, Ralph. We just passed a scrub here that I'm sure would be quite a useful prey animal in the falconry industry, indeed. They are very interesting birds, falcons. I do quite enjoy them, and it's not because my surname is quite similar, but, well, maybe a little bit because my surname is similar. But uh, we are in the black and white spectrum at the moment, the infrared, if you did not notice. So that we are now looking for the nocturnals. Driving quite slowly. I'm doing a bit of a loop. I've decided to go left. Instead of right towards where it's it watching, well, I've gone left, back towards the north and towards the other side of Gallego again. See if maybe tracks of any of those individuals that Herbie was trailing earlier maybe pop out on the road. We'll come back again. Who has got their fingers crossed for last minute leopard? Cheetah cats, a serveline genet. No, I, I've never even heard of one. Never even heard of one. V, I've seen the large and the small spotted genet. Central. I've never been up to Central Africa or further north. I have been to the Mara. So you could say I was in Kenya, but not very long. Ten days. I didn't get out too much. But other than that, I haven't visited any other countries in Africa um, north of Kenya. I've spent some time in the airport at 
at Addis Ababa, which you probably can't say I've experienced. We've got some hares in the road. Where is my falcon to come and catch them? It is their time of day to come out. And definitely a Servaline Janet would probably catch one of these. Carla, your fingers and toes. Well, hopefully we find one soon, so you don't have to remain in such an uncomfortable position for too long. But I'm just picturing these two hares suddenly standing up on their back legs and having a box, aren't you? Wouldn't that be funny? Maybe a bit of a face scrub first. Just woken up, they're telling me. Come on, Steve, let me at least scratch around a bit. Here we go. He's moving in. No, he's not. Time for a little bit of breakfast. They've already had their breakfast, though, folks. So uh, you can see he's busy eating on some grass now. When the hare comes out of their little scrub, warren-type sort of underbush accommodations, they will generally eat the feces that they deposited before going to bed. A very poorly digested ball of feces, which they will then eat. Well, we could call it dung, really, couldn't we? We couldn't call it feces, but dung. Um, and which they then re-digest because they've got a very poor digestive system and they don't really have the teeth to chew it and mas masticate it down like we do. So that's often what they do first up and then they'll do some grooming and then go off. Bless you, Senzo. He must be allergic to hair. <laughs> Kathy, you know, many kangaroos, they do look like it with their massive ears. Lovely cheeks, so that's why they're very relaxed. It's almost pitch black, but their enormous eye and their enormous ears assist them in, in moving about and feeding in safety. But obviously being with a group is helpful, so one is watching out a little bit while the other one feeds. Kathy, they are very, very long. Obviously, assists in their movement and their running style. And hares can run very, very fast. Don't, don't ask me to tell you how fast, but they move very quickly, and they have an amazing ability to move left and right. That sidestepping motion, which I'm sure the back foot pays quite a quite a role in, enables them to evade the clutches of a pursuer. Doesn't always work for them. And then once they do escape, they've got that very good ability to stand very still, motionless. And it doesn't look very tasty at all, what it's eating. Well, I suppose if you eat your own poo for breakfast, anything's better than that, isn't it? <laughs> the day can only get it, the day can only get better. Okay, well, without disturbing these hairs, we're going to try to get past and continue on our way. In the meantime, let's go see what Ralph has to say. Well, there we are, everyone. The night birds, oh, well, the night birds that were. That was a little fiery-necked nightjar, and fiery as he was, he flew off. But uh, one of the very common night birds that we get around at the moment and well pretty much all year really um, and they are obviously struggling probably a little bit more at this time of year because um, there's not uh, as much around in the way of food because they would eat mostly the moths I would say is probably their dominant part of the diet of fiery neck night jars and there's not I mean there are moths and there are insects but um, yeah, I'm sure that the, it's not as easily found and secured as it would be in summer because in summer there is a lot of food for those guys and other insect eating birds now Jamie um, I would say that's probably a resounding yes and that that's uh, you know around the world I think it's um, I, I think in general you know we've, we've got more people we've got uh, human encroachment um, 
You know, th these natural areas have, have uh, always been here, and in some places they've expanded. However, I just feel that with more people comes more waste, comes more, um, you know, people living in wilderness areas that used to once be wild tracts of land. There's now houses and roads, and, and so there's less space for pure wilderness areas like this. Um, and so I just think out of national parks, I think the, the wilderness areas outside of national parks has decreased and so those holding areas of different populations of insects and birds etc um, uh, uh, you know the populations have decreased in number uh, I would have to say uh, you know through guessing um, but I, I think it's the law of averages more more humans more, um, less wild tracts of land uh, equals less animals so uh, I, I would have to say yes definitely decreased but what can we do um, Do we stop breeding as humans Do we um, all live in rabbit warrens in high-rise buildings where you know we're all living on top of each other I know in some cities that is the case around the world whether it's Johannesburg or um, oh, let me go down that road, uh, or Shanghai or Mumbai or New Mexico um, you know, in, in cities, there's, there's, you know, there's a lot less space for people and everybody living on top of each other. But do we live like that all around the world um, and then open up wilderness areas? You know, um, and do we control our own population? It's, it's tough, tough subjects. It's, uh, do we stop modern medicine? You know, I think I probably shouldn't be alive. Now, the, the next question, is it easy to reverse animal numbers? I, I, I suppose you're asking, um, is it easy to reverse the decline uh, in numbers? Or if the numbers have gone down, would it be easy to reverse that? It all depends on um, the particular species that you're talking about. Like, for instance, with lions, elephants, cheetah, wild dogs. These, these animals are very difficult to protect. Yes, you can protect them in national parks, but outside of national parks, um, they just, they're too big. They're a threat to humans in all senses of the word, um, both directly and their food uh, and their livelihoods. Um, and so all of those, you know, predators and large mammals, uh, very difficult to to justify um, keeping them alive when they're a threat to the humans. I mean, take lions for instance. Um, would you be comfortable knowing that there's lions uh, walking around your house when you've got little kids? Would you really? I don't. I wouldn't be. Um, so, well, I wasn't. I used to, uh, my little boy was born and, I, and we lived in the Kruger Park and when he got old enough, uh, he was walking around and there were lions coming into camp. Eventually, we had, we left, okay, um, because it was in a national park and uh, it was either stay and live with the danger or leave. So, you know, we had to decide to leave. But uh, you see what I mean? It, it, when, it, when it hits home a little bit harder, it's easy to sit and say, you know, the, 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 the kind of things that you might say when it's easy to say it, but put yourself in that position and things become a little bit different. Um, you know, I often had people, um, my, you know, have, having an opinion about the locals in the Namib, um, which uh, had the desert elephants coming through and destroying their vegetable garden, um, pulling down their water tanks and also destroying their windmill. Um, and then those people getting very aggressive towards the elephants and in some cases even going and shooting them uh, for, so that they could stop them from basically destroying their, their livelihood. Uh, in every sense of the word. Um, and then you have people with an opinion against those people. I think you've got to go and live there, you know, to, to have an opinion. All right, let's go quickly over to Steve. Exciting. Yes, there he is. Thank you, Ralph. Bush baby's busy. Busy drinking the sap off of the tree. It's a little bit far off. Very relaxed. A little bit too far, hey, Sands? Mm -hmm. 
We're trying. We're trying. We just need a little bit of light on him, otherwise he's not going to be seen, I'm afraid, with the, the infrared. He's just a little bit too far off for the infrared to pick up on him, but he's very relaxed. He's got no problem with the light. And he's quite easily digging his teeth into the sap of that tree. His breakfast is tree sap. Sounds a lot better than that. Sounds a lot better than... <laughs> Kathy, yes, it's always wonderful to find the bush babies. And his breakfast is far nicer than that of the scrub hare. A lot juicier, but the different adaptations. Bush baby obviously is taken to the trees and lives a very different life to, to the scrub hare, although they're both nocturnal, coming out to not compete with the other animals, obviously avoiding sort of predators on the ground by going into the trees, being very efficient climbers. There we go. There he's going. And with the very sharp teeth to enable them to gouge into the sap. Very agile, isn't it? Moving along. Very hard to actually keep up with him. And he's going to go down. Where is he going to go? Whoops. Up. <laughs> yes, Kathy, they are completely nocturnal, uh, completely nocturnal in their wanderings. I've only ever seen one sort of maybe just as it's getting dusk coming out of a nest, but they don't go very far. It's just their, their element of competition. They've got very big eyes for seeing in the dark, and they, they rummage through trees, feeding on all sorts of insects, as well as the bar or the, the sap of the tree. So very very nicely uh, territorial moving through the trees urinating on their hands they cover the trees with their urine to say this is my tree this is my tree and I know a few people that have rescued some bush babies and they're very very become very tame and they like to hang in your hair and then they also like to urinate all over you so if you're into that sort of thing <laughs> I'm not a big fan a friend of mine told me you get used to it I'm not sure if I would get used to warm, sticky fluid. Uh, no, going down the back of your head through your hair. No, not a fan. Lyra, we probably could. We probably could. It's not like maple syrup. I've, I'll have i actually try and get some out, one of the trees. It's probably quite... It's, it doesn't have too much of a flavor to it. It's very bland. You'd think it's quite sugary, but it's not. It's... It's not at all. Um, sticky, indeed, depending on the tree. I've, I've done it with knob thorns, and I've also done it with the, the sap off of fever trees. And it looks like it's going to be tasty, but there's absolutely nothing to it that I can taste. But there's still, still nutrients in it. I think we're the only animals out there that make things taste nicer so we can eat it. Animals just eat things because they're hungry. We've become very picky in what we do haven't we? Even the medicines we have these days, we add sugar to. 100% joy, I would say that's exactly why. Um, they're just more visible. Um, also, I think our game drives are going into the darkness a bit more. If you remember in summer, uh, we were sort of almost closing before, uh, just as the sun set. So the bush babies were still enjoying the, the you know, the, the, the night allowing the night to sort of cool down should I say before moving out so now that it's quite dark and it's already getting quite, quite chilly it's time for them to move in search of food and because the temperatures and the darkness is there the temperatures low and the darkness is there it means it's a good time to be moving but uh, they're still around in summer if you go out late at night you will definitely find them but I think the leaves as you suggest being less leaves on the trees makes it a bit easier to find but they, they are stand out from a very long way when you get them on the spotlight. Beautiful big red glaring eyes shine back at you. A very nice layer on the back of the iris which facilitates the absorption of lots of light. James, this is a very good question. Um, it's possibly got to do with the habitat. Um, Thick-tailed bush babies like really tall habitat trees, uh, probably quite more riverine areas. Uh, pr pretty similar, I suppose, to baboons. Um, and I think that's maybe the, the major reason 
really tall sort of green habitat trees along major river courses uh, are maybe a little bit more favorable to them. They're not, I suppose, as agile as um, as the, the lesser bush baby, which you see here, which can maybe make its living on a on a less adequate diet, I suppose, or, or they primarily feed on, on the bark or the, the gum out here. But, you know, you go to sort of more wetland areas, more permanent rivers, and the, the thick-tailed bush babies are a lot more prevalent, especially up in an area or down an area called St. Lucia down in the, the coast, sort of northeastern South Africa underneath uh, Swaziland. St. Lucia is a very foresty wetland area there. They are prolific in that area with abundance of food and abundance, abundance of moisture. That's what they love. Okay, well, we're getting towards the end of the evening and uh, we are nearly at Voyatilla Dam for one last shot at a last minute leopard. Hello everyone. Well, we're still looking around, looking, looking for, I'm trying to find a little chameleon and I'm glad that Steve managed to get another bush baby. That's fantastic because we've really struggled for them. Um, and in the last week or two, it seems like David and, oh, I had one that also hung around, but David had a few and uh, Steve's also having a few of them. So that is awesome. I'm glad that they are just giving enough time to be able to see them properly. Bridget, um, the Gallego, the late, uh, the closest, you know, it's, it's uh, probably the primates, I would say, um, that are the closest link to the bush babies, if I'm not mistaken, as I say. Um, but we're also now near to Voyotella Dam. You might see Steve pop through there in a minute. I thought I'd just be quiet here and listen out if um, we could hear any rasping. Um, and let's have a look up at that moon there while we're at it, because maybe we hear Tingano rasping here. He does like to call at about this time of night, but um, still quite quiet for this time and while well, the moon is absolutely stunning and we are now slowly heading towards the end of the drive. Once again it's been an absolutely smashing day and so um, always the thanks going to the team in FC and to the teams of guides that have been moving around. Most of all, thanks you to the viewers. Now, please join us again tomorrow morning. I'm signing out. Good night and goodbye.